Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a historic moment in this podcast as with you history. This is a moment you're going to be telling your grandkids about. And that is the day the talented voice actor, actor, producer, director, and of course, the voice of Rindo in New York, The World Ends With You, Paul Castro Jr. joined us today on this podcast, Ends With You, for an interview where we talk about everything from his acting career to his memories with Twiwi, and of course, the most important of debates is cereal soup. It's some, some really hot stuff in here, you guys. But on a real note, Paul is awesome and is incredibly humble and is incredibly nice and has been incredibly helpful and it's really my honor and my privilege to finally be able to have him on the podcast for you guys to enjoy and for us to really enjoy, really enjoy the competition too. But before you can enjoy it, you know what time it is. Thank you to our patrons, Kyle Turpy, Krista Ventresca, Dark Dude, Saimazu Shipper, Shin Kojin, Zeta Slow, RSP, Willow, and Exilra. Thank you all so much for your continued support. But without further ado, take it away, my friend. Hey, what's up, everybody? Paul Castro Jr., the voice of Rindo Kanade in Neo The World Ends With You, and you should all listen and watch this podcast ends with you. You're really going to like this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, boys, oh, hold on, we're not ready. Hold on a second. Hold on. I, I thought we were ready. We were definitely not ready. Hold up. Hold up, you guys. It's all good. Where is it? There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is a monumental day in the history of the world. Not just this podcast. This is a monumental day of the history of the world. I have been getting texts about it. My grandparents in Egypt have been texting me about it. It's followed me to the dinner table. It's followed me to the buses that I take on the town. When I started the podcast, people told me, Ahmed, when are you going to have Paul Castro Jr. on the podcast? To which I answered, he would never want to come on because I'm too loud. But I was wrong! I was wrong, and I've never been prouder and happier to be wrong in my life. So, this is a monumental milestone for the podcast for me to welcome. Not only do I welcome Osmaneku. Whoa, slow it down there, friendo. This is Ahmed from the future, from the editing bay, to tell you that uh, I, I messed up pretty bad here. There was issues with listening to the Discord audio and the stream when we started. Uh, this does get fixed in a minute. Usually I would edit this out, but, you know, this was pretty funny and pulpit along with it. And you know what? You guys need to, I need to be humanized. You guys need to hear me mess up because I know you guys idolize me. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Back to the episode. But also, I get to welcome... I, you know him, you love him. I, I could introduce him, but really, I think you guys already know. Uh, well-renowned actor, voice actor, producer, voice actor, community member. What can't he do? Mr. Paul Castro Jr., thank you very much. Welcome to this podcast ends with you. You you are crystal clear. Oh, hold on a second. Well, you know what? It's it's funny that you say that we don't have technical difficulties because apparently, apparently, people can't hear you. Everyone's quiet. I'm an only podcast. Well, you know what, Paul? Thank you, Paul. Thank you for jinxing us. I really appreciate it. Uh. Okay, well, let me, uh, let's, let's do this, let's do this, because this, I, that's weird, because people should be able to hear you guys. Oh my god, I think I know what the issue is, I know what the issue what is, What did you, guys. you do? I didn't do Jack, I'm good, so here's what we're gonna do, right, we're gonna do, we're gonna do this, right, okay, we're gonna can do- Can we be heard now? Can, can people, can, can, can they be heard? Hello? Hello! Okay, uh, there we go. popping off, we're good. Okay, so here's here's what here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. All right, are you ready, everyone? All right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pretend none of that ever happened. <laughs> okay, and then we're gonna go back. We're gonna it's play like the music again, and then like like as if nothing. And then I want you to come back with the same energy. I'll edit the other intro because I've like, already forgotten the intro I did. But we'll come back. I'll just be like, and here's podcast studio, and then it'll be fine. It'll be totally okay. Are you all ready? This is what we're Already. doing. All right, cool. take two. Ladies and gentlemen, streaming is a blow up. 
I just like to announce that before we even do anything here. That streaming is a blow up. That's like, hey, you, if you want to expose yourself to being the most incompetent person possible, just start streaming on Twitch. It's a very good way of doing it. <laughs> it's 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 incredibly incredibly. I had a whole intro ready. I wasn't even recording the intro. Paul Kester Jr., welcome to this podcast. Ends with you. The people hey, who know you are. Hey, what's up? This is my first time here. This, it's crazy. It's, right? Thank you for having me on. Wild. Perfect. Per a hundred percent perfect first try. Yeah, exactly. I hope so. It's, Can it's, everyone hear us? Is it, is everything good? Yeah. Sh why would they not hear you, Neku? Come on, you don't trust me and my production no, quality abilities. That's the problem. It's you're, not. It's not the audio balancing problems. It's not because I'm too quiet. Yeah, you're 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 totally good. You are totally good. Um, so Paul Cast Junior, welcome. Uh, on a personal Thank note. Thank you so much for having me. I Honestly, this is uh, it's so fun. You guys are doing a great job with this. And uh, hey, hey, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this is going to be so much fun. If you guys aren't following them, do that. Look, you can you can try and flatter us all you want, Paul Castro, but you will not escape the hard hitting questions that we have in store for you. You have no idea the. I think we have TMZ on standby. <laughs> we might get some some hot guys. I'm not involving TMC in anything that we do. I want you to kick them out <laughs> right now. Do I have to? What does Rindo listen to when he's going to the bathroom on the toilet? That's what's hard hitting. Question. Your ocean. That's Next what question. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we want to know. Um. So, uh, first of all, of course, thank you very much for coming on and for general support. Not only has this meant so. See, this is weird, right? Because I was expecting most guests to be like, "Yeah, sure, I'll come on," and then they come on and they do the thing. Paul has also been helping me out and supporting the show in the background for months. <laughs> Ever since, like, I've had this uh, planned for, for months back, and I'm glad that it's, it's not surreal knowing that this is now happening, you know? <laughs> uh, well, honestly, it is, it's, it's, again, I seriously, I'm, I, I love this community. I love anybody who is spreading love and, uh, and encouraging people to check out this series. And it's surreal for me to be a part of it. So, like, if I can help in any way that I can, what you guys are doing, which is a phenomenal thing for everybody who may or may not know about the series or is starting to start play it and they're looking for content about it, then, yeah, I'm going to be there. That's a, a no-brainer. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for making the time. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about how um, uh, this interview is going to go. Uh, or the conversation. Let's go with the word conversation. That's less formal. Um, there. Isn't the word so. interview in the title? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's marketing. Marketing, Neku. Um, as if I care about marketing. Not as if it's not my job for the podcast. That's, that's true. So <laughs> uh, here's how this is going to work. How this is going to work is uh, we're going to talk to people a little bit about your sort of uh, general career and life outside of uh, the world ends with you, because I don't think a lot of people realize how quite how accomplished you are outside of the world ends with you and the kind of accolades that you have uh, accumulated throughout the years. Well, I was born at eight twenty seven a.m. Uh, my mother I came out at nine pounds four ounces. Night baby. <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah, I'm safe. We'll we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get we'll get to the specifics. <laughs> Of your birthday uh, in just a moment. We'll talk about that first, and then the we're going to talk. Life story. And then we're going to talk about um, some of uh, your experiences again, more specifically to do with Twiwi and Neo Twiwi and that whole experience. And then we also have some questions from Patreon, from Twitter, and of course from chat. If any of you guys want to ask any questions, uh, shoot them in the comments section. I believe we have Agent Random on standby, ready to accept all your questions, and uh, we will hopefully uh, get to them in the end. So, uh, you know, no time left to present. Let's let's get started straight away. Uh, so you were saying you were born at 3 a.m.? Was it 3, 3 a.m.? Uh, I, uh, honestly, I, I don't do... Do people know that? I, I really... I, mean, there, I know there's some people who do. I'll actually... Uh, my, my partner, Allie, she loves astrology, and she had to do, like, my moon and rising sign. So I do know that I am... I have a... a, a I think I'm, like, a Leo rising, and I'm a Scorpio moon or something, but I'm Whoa. an Aries, so do with that what you will. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, so we have two hotheads on the podcast. This is okay. a bad idea. Sweet. Is that I'm also an Aries. Oh. oh, great. Good. We got the horns then. Nice. Yep. <laughs> and I'm a Leo because it, I'm sure it has nothing to do oh, with all show. All the fire signs are in the room. This is going to yeah. be bad. I'm sure this has nothing to do with show. It's fine. Don't worry about it. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Not a problem whatsoever. Uh, so, Paul. Yeah. Prior to divorcing Rindo, you've had an incredibly diverse career in acting and producing and directing. 
including uh, getting the Rising Star Award in 2014. I didn't make that up. He actually got a Rising Star Award in 2014. It's it's, it's bonkers. Uh, for for those who are not aware uh, of this side of your career, uh, can you take us through the start uh, and some of the highlights of your acting career? Sure. Well, again, uh, uh, rising. I think that star kind of fell. So hopefully, uh, you know, true. we can. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been, I've been, um, I've been very lucky to work in theater, theater, TV, film, voiceover, all that stuff. I, I started out doing. Uh, I started out doing theater, and then I moved into doing uh, TV, and then film came shortly after, and then voiceover was kind of like the last um the the last flagpole that i planted in the ground because i had started out with my my i i didn't want to do pre-med i went to college for like pre-med instantly found out i hated it and i got into like a comedy uh, comedy group started realizing wait a second i can like goof around for a living heck yeah i want to do that (laughs) uh so i was doing like these uh, there's a youtube lol comedy lol it exists you can see sketches of me that are horribly horribly bad except for one that exists about farmville which was actually kind of funny and actually got like a bunch of views um when i'm in college and then um so i i started training for theater doing all that stuff and I, I I was like, man, that would be so cool to do uh, a, a voiceover. Teacher told me I should learn how to act first if I wanted to do VO. Got involved with Off Broadway. Broadway went to college for it. Um, got cast in TV shows like Limitless, Blue Bloods, uh, God Friended Me, uh, Law and Order, The Blacklist. I was in movies with like uh, Bill Hader and Kristen Wiig called The Skeleton Twins. I did a movie with Jermaine Clement, People Places Things. A movie with Ed Asner, who most of you might know as the grandpa from Up, uh, called The Garden Left Behind, uh, and many other indie films and, and other stuff that I've done and along that ride I was lucky enough to get an award from the Garden State Film Festival which mind you I got an award alongside Diane Ladd and um, uh, uh, Laura Dern who you guys might know as uh, from Star Wars and Jurassic Park so you know I'm in the same room getting awarded your career is huge man the the imposter syndrome is very very real so uh, yeah all that stuff happened I started making movies I wrote a movie uh, called Eris name yes based on of the English translation of Aerith from Final Fantasy 7 and then I did more producing I did a movie about Madonna uh I made a TV series about gamers so I'm all over the place I know it's a TLDR of 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 me but we can talk about any specifics if there's something of there that that didn't sound terribly boring yeah I mean there's I mean there's definitely there's definitely something we're gonna touch on uh later I mean I think I think I should clarify when I said um I didn't make this up about the right Star Wars. That you definitely don't. Um, you're incredibly humble, <laughs> and and I don't. You're think underselling people, yourself by a long shot, right? A now. lot. Like uh, I think, um, I think the exact words that were exchanged before this podcast went live were, uh, I was like, oh, you know, it's it's it's. I'm very proud to have you uh, on the podcast. A big moment for the podcast and all that. And he uh, and literally your words were, if I can make people happy, then uh, then then I've done a good thing. <laughs> so. That's the truth, though, and 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 again, undersell over deliver. I always say undersell over deliver. That's, Remember that. That's a good mantra uh, in life. Uh, we're gonna get on to some of uh, your other appearances first. What I'm personally quite interested in, though, that you mentioned there that uh, I didn't realize is c- can you take a, talk to us a little bit more about that show about gaming? Because I think this is gonna kind of take us into your interest in gaming in general. Like, what was that like? Uh, so again, I. I... <sighs> It's so weird because I feel like um, maybe it's an inherent feeling of maybe getting cast in a game and and being a gamer. I always feel like um, <laughs> there people might be like, oh, he's lying. He's not really into games. He made his studio look the way it is because he's doing it now. It's whatever. I'm like, <laughs> I am just as hardcore of a gamer and fan of all this stuff as most of the people who are hanging out in this chat or follow me are. I really like my life growing up was video games, anime, and all the stuff. I played Dota 2 pretty heavily. I played competitive Smash Brothers growing up. I was like in that scene going to tournaments. Magic the Gathering I've placed in top 10 qualifying uh, IQs. Um, I, I, oh, you know, wow. gaming has been part of my life 
I grew up in a game store called the Game Factory, and where my I grew up in, in Jersey, and right. from like basically growing up in there, you know, going after school, walking to the game store, playing Magic, playing GoldenEye, playing Smash Brothers, to eventually you know getting into MMOs. I played Final Fantasy XI for way too long in my life, and then I got into World of Warcraft, Overwatch, you know, uh, SOCOM two, shooting Call of Duties, all of that. I was you know all over the place in addition to JRPGs and all that stuff, and. As I was getting into film and making my own stuff and writing, everybody always says, write what you know. And I'm like, well, the thing I know most about is video games. And every piece of content that was gaming related, like let's just take that movie Pixels that Adam Sandler did, for instance. And I was like, this is trash. No offense to the people who made it. So bad. I I (laughs) watched that movie in theaters. It was so bad. (laughs) I know. And, and and again, it takes a tremendous amount of hard work from people to make it. And I don't want people to like think I'm I'm trying to bash the people who's uh, uh, put a lot of hard work into it. But I think that there was a, a company that terribly missed the mark and tried to capitalize on a community of people who didn't want to be pandered to. And I was like, oh, cue me. I'm part of that community. I have a skill set to make something. Let me write about growing up in this game store. And I did just that. I wound up uh, uh, working with a, a friend of mine and uh, a couple of other investors. We shot a pilot in uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey over a week and blood, sweat, and tears when I tell you this was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. We built an entire game store. If you go through like old social media posts of mine, you could probably find like pictures of the store that we literally made from an abandoned, like not abandoned, like a, a, an empty warehouse. Oh, wow. And myself, my partner, Allie, we were in there building this stuff with our, our, our set designer, uh, Kaylee Bison, who like a, a phenomenal uh he was our, our artistic director and everything and uh his partner um they they transformed this place but we were there painting putting up wallpaper building stuff we were de- you know and insanity to to make this all happen and we submitted it to HBO and the Emmys have a festival or had one at the time called ITV Fest which has later become Catalyst Mm-hmm. I know I'm saying a lot of bull, bull that people aren't going to care about, but we wind up getting an official selection premiere there. We got picked up by a content studio to to make this show uh, uh, in the process of pitching it and all this other stuff. The pandemic happened and that uh-huh. took the wind out of our sails and uh, we reacquired the rights. And now we're sitting on this um, pilot, which... We are still pitching, but are trying to figure out the way in which we either will distribute this or use it to pitch to um, other networks. And we've also reimagined it as a short form series. We've reimagined it as an animated series. I have like, I don't know if they're on my social media or not, but there's like some bits and pieces of it that you can find that exist online. But again, we're trying to, you know, keep it mysterious and exclusivity for anybody who wants to invest or, or pick it up. So this is like, so you're almost like, uh, you're creating an idea, you're creating almost a prototype, if as it were, of the thing, and then just hoping to God that it's liked enough by the powers that be to pick it up, fund it, and then it becomes a full sort of full-fledged production. Yeah, that's typically how most people do it. They either make a web series, which is shorter episodes, or they're longer but lower budget, or they'll shoot a pilot like what what we did. We took kind of the traditional route. Sometimes people just write a script, but we wanted to show people like you don't have to think about how the show is going to be. Here is how it's going to be. Yeah. And we're really proud of the show we made. It's a little edgy for people. I think like we pitched it to to, to networks like Nickelodeon and stuff, and they're like, yeah a little too old for our demographic here and stuff and right. it, it's more of a mix between it's always sunny in philadelphia and uh fx is the league which was about fantasy football with like kind of the heart and soul of uh like new girl so mm-hmm. we we were like a nice melting pot of all those type of shows yeah like it's i mean and were you so you were you then the, the kind of the producer on that or what are you like what role do you hold in there Everything. I was the showrunner, the producer. I wasn't the. I hired a really talented director, Steon Halfstead, who helped us tremendously make this come to life. He's gone on to do his own show on the CW, uh, Saving the Human Race, and he's uh, he was the one of the creators behind the YouTube channel Pistol Shrimps. Where if you've ever seen on YouTube, uh, uh, the tr- you know the troll guy who's like la 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 the original meme, the beginning. He made the video, which was like Trollololol Saruman. So if you've ever seen that video, oh my where it's like, god! 
Yeah, Saruman falling off of the, the, the his tower and doing that. He is the creator of that YouTube channel, Pistol Shrimps. Um, extremely talented guy. He, That's he made our show what it was. Um, but again, yeah, I am by myself and Allie producing, show running, editing, um, it, just all hands on deck, you know, working on the set. It was really just kind of like we had to make this, didn't have a ton of money. And I mean, we had a lot of money by like certain people's standards, but in the film making process, like, you know, these type of shows are made for like five million dollars an episode we had mm. fifty thousand so you know yeah, it was yeah. extremely difficult it's completely different and i think that's it's, i think which is yeah go ahead Nico. it's so interesting to hear about the backstory of how you got into this part of the industry because you are you're more of a unique case than i think most people realize when it comes yeah. to video game adaptations or things based on games there aren't a lot of like actual gamers in the industry that's mm -hmm. why we have what feels like a lot of B movies for video games and how to like really attach themselves to video games. Like ready player one is my favorite example of it is based on video games, but the people who made it don't quite know how video games work. Oh yeah. And, my favorite, one of my favorite books. And I saw that movie and I remember I was in the theater with a couple of friends and they're like, Oh, that was great. I'm like, if you read this book, you would see how many marks were missed. Yeah, mm -hmm. like there were so many little details that were just thrown out the window and mm -hmm. random cameos that were thrown in that made no sense for the book's story at all. Yeah. And hearing about how you're going towards the direction of a producer and seeing how you're bringing your love of games from your childhood into it gives me a lot of hope for the movie industry as you put more time and effort and money into that sort of project. Because if it does get picked up, it'll be a golden example of this is the, the standard now. This is what you have yeah. to do if you want to get gamers' attention. It's so true, and I appreciate the kind words there. And and you know, it, it, if if we wind up having to release, like let's say a the pilot through our own means, it's going to come down to the community and uh, uh, the people who support me to support this project and let you know the world know that yeah, we like this. Can somebody please like take a look at this and say yeah, like what happened with Broad City and. Uh, the, Abby and Alana, who made that, you know, they started off as a web series where they posted their stuff on YouTube and somebody saw it and picked it up. Um, because the other challenge that we came across was we had people interested, but they wanted us to change things. And we knew that if we were going to compromise the content in that sense or make it kind of like, um, for instance, I'm not going to use direct names of the of these companies or people, but they wanted us to basically make this an entire brand um, a product placement type of show where we were going to be promoting product and brand pretty much through every episode. So, and that, that, that ruins do, your vision essentially, right? It, yeah, exactly. The whole thing we were setting out to do, it's contradictory to trying to be authentic to the community when, like, they want us to do an episode on uh, I, I Candy Crush. When like, because they are going to be a sponsor for you know these are all exa these are not actual yeah. examples. I'm making fake ones, but like yeah, you do an episode about Candy Crush or this other new mobile game, and it's like no, that's the thing where we set out. Did you read the project deck? We talk about hating all that stuff, and you want us yeah. to to do exactly that. So it's it's a it's a hard road to navigate because on one hand you want to get the thing made and you want to have the leverage for other people to let you make more content, but on the other hand you don't want to compromise, um, you know, your vision. So it's kind of a rock and a hard place sometimes. It's weird, yeah, because it's I, like I even noticed that just with with we're yeah. producing even the podcast from week to week is that I realize there's. Um, there's a spectrum of what you want to do and what you want to create and the things I have to do to make it happen and the things I have to do to make it, uh, you know, to have that exposure. Um, oh, yeah. I don't love having to do, like, you know, clickbait thumbnails or do very, like, uh, attractive titles to videos to get people's attention, even if they're not, mm -hmm. like, 100% accurate. But the fact of the matter is, it works. It works. <laughs> it works and unless, and unless the algorithm the algorithm says hey here here's your attention that you've been looking for and i don't know how in the world they try to do that because when again i do a lot of the back end for the podcast and i'm and i sit down and have meetings about it all the time and we're like how do we make this make sense because yeah. Like Twitter and YouTube have such weird algorithms that we have experimented for weeks to try to figure out what they want and we can never truly figure it out because it's just numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and I bet you see the best return when you're like, screw it. I'm going to do the thing that like we believe in 
within the parameters of, you know, like the things that we know that work, you know, whether that's a, a time of day or certain hashtags or whatever. But the we, more that you make it the way you want, it's probably the way it resonates more with, with the fans. That's a delicate It's so funny that, to that you mentioned like timestamps and I'll let Ahmed rant about this in a minute. We we figured out our golden hour by accident. <laughs> it's it's like it's it's a del- like what 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 you're saying, Paul. Like it's definitely a delicate dance because like I think like I think we pride ourselves in that like we are. Well, I feel <laughs> we try to be fairly authentic. Like yes, I'll, I'll sort of, um, I'll sort of put put like um, like change the title and stuff to be more attractive. But I do think that we do stay true and we never, at the core of it, like our our love for the game and like what what this is actually about. That should be at the core of everything that we do. Mm. Uh, and we have been doing that. And I'm, I'm proud that we have been doing that. Um, and I think it's important that you don't lose your way because I've seen a lot of people that just go like 100% full on into just like, you know, I want to create stuff for the views or for the money or for whatever it is. Mm. Uh, like, I don't, I went into creating this podcast. Like, thankfully now uh, we have Patreon, which is uh, twi- uh, patreon.com slash TPWY if you want to uh, support us. <laughs> um, the ultimate shill, as always. But uh, thanks to those <laughs> wonderful patrons, we're at least self-sustaining now. But yeah, like, that's awesome! Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but we didn't have a plan. I didn't plan to get a cent <laughs> out of this. Um, mm. So really, all this and how it grew was is just a, a massive bonus. Um, I listen. I, I my my Twitch like I've thankfully had great people like uh, um, you know Venti Wenti and 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 Natty helping me with all my stuff to a degree and and they were like yeah you got to do this this and this and they're like and they're like do you have people who are subbing to you I'm like I think so they're like you don't get money for that I'm like wait what I was, I was like so wait I was like I was like wait the bits are real money yeah, and yeah. they're like yeah check your, your money. dashboard I'm like oh god I didn't I, I'm not because I'm not really doing it for that but again like I've come to realize you know the more that you get support from people the easier it becomes to do what you want and the things you can either, you know, outsource or um, uh, it makes it alleviate the stress on doing the things you don't want to do. Yeah. You know, uh, having more hands on deck or, or more funds to, to create the thing or you can dedicate more time to it, the better. And to that effect, uh, I want to move on to uh, my next question, uh, because I think it's, you've touched on something very interesting there, is that you've mentioned sort of um you know uh the show uh the game sorry i didn't catch the name of the show um it's called it was it used to, it used to be called um next big thing and right. then it and the the, it, the reason it was called that was because all of our characters started off the the idea it's like it, we've been working on this for a very long time we mm-hmm. shot like a pre-pilot like a, a like a a, a seed pilot of uh, our characters and they all wanted to like do like get rich quick schemes and one right. of the characters was a gamer we did like a test screening of that with certain people and they're like this character that you play which was my character obviously he was the gamer they're like that <laughs> seems like the thing that you want to be doing <laughs> just mm-hmm. do that and then yeah. we, we we went full on in that direction and uh, so it was called next big thing because that's what it was previously and then uh, it became untitled gamer comedy if you look it up online but the title that w- the working title now is the game factory so for example okay so for example the game factory right uh, you you've, you've talked about it a bunch now you've and we cl- everybody clearly sees how passionate about you are about this project you have that and and you're in that uh, headspace but then you're also doing stuff like you know appearing in law and order SVU uh, being an actor, all these things where you don't have as much control, and you're just sort of being, you know, directed around the place, and directed to to act and do stuff uh, a certain way. So I guess my question is, is sort of what's the difference between those two realms, and what do you prefer being in? Like, how do you, how does it feel to switch between sort of like you know producer or sort of visionary mode, and sort of being more of an actor or a piece in in a bigger puzzle? Totally, uh, great question. It's I think. When I get to just act, sometimes it's it's nice and it's a relief to be like, okay, I don't have to worry about everything else. I'm here to do one job and that's it. I can focus solely on that and uh, it can be a relief. At the same time, I also have that director, producer, writer brain where I'm constantly having to hold back from saying something where it's like, right. actually, I think the, rhyme would, the line would sound better like this or you realize that if we just, we move the light there that it would actually look better. You know, like things like that, I have to kind of hold my tongue or like just realize you're here to do this job just do the job you were hired to do mm-hmm. um 
on the other hand, where I am producing and I'm doing all of the, uh, you know, directing, whatever else I'm more involved, it's way more stressful, but I kind of like that stress. I feel like I'm fighting like a behemoth when I'm doing right. it. It's like there is this battle, like I'm, I'm literally fighting for survival, like, you know, dealing with um, anxiety, stress, um, migraines, and trying to make every puzzle piece fit, you know, scheduling locations get screwed up, actors need different, ske- uh, uh, you know, like uh, transportation, uh, whatever it is like it's really trying to make this ginormous puzzle come together in a really short period of time and i like that um i'm also trying to get better at again delegating hiring people who are good at what they do and again it takes money to do that so you can focus on the thing that you want to do is that difficult Um, to do by the way (laughs) Yeah, yes. some, yes. some people say <laughs> it is very, very hard to do. And uh, the other, the other part of that is when I get to work on my own stuff, I get to tell the stories that I believe in and the stories that resonate with me and the characters that I find most interesting. So. I saw there was no content really about gamers in the way that I was doing it, so I wrote the story about it. I saw that there was no really movies that were dealing with um, losing a pet in the way that I did, so I wrote Eris. You know, um, it, it just kind of was able to take control of my career to a degree, and I, yeah, it's like very empowering for an actor. It's yeah, like, and that's the thing, right? Because like, even even for me, uh, like, obviously, this podcast is not, nowhere near the level that you're talking about. But even for me, uh, as like, uh, like, yet. as as the captain at the helm, he is correct. <laughs> oh, please stop! <laughs> it's very kind. Thank you. Um, but like, even as the captain of the ship and the original of the idea and the host of the, of the show, uh, like I get, uh, I get final say on a lot of things, mostly to protect these guys. Like my mentality is, if I get to get sign final sign off on decisions and they don't work out, I don't want any of these people catching the blame. Um, um. But uh, in that vein, because I put myself in that position, um, I've I've learned that I can be very sort of particular and very persnickety about certain things. Like, mm. uh, like someone, I, I tell somebody to do something and then they do it, and I'll be like, I, I just find myself almost nitpicking because it's not the exact vision that I have in my head, you know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Like, there's uh, I'm not sure if you can relate that or not, or not, because like I've had to sort of like learn sort of where to direct and where to say things need to be very specific and then where to give people sort of more rain uh more free rein to do stuff i don't know if that's something that's come up for you 100 percent. i first of all i there's a there's a there's a lot to be said here and i'll start off by saying that i have literally i was working with a composer once and i was like so particular about like certain sounds and and i'm not a composer but i think i have an ear for music and i was like you know we were working on this one little thing that nobody was going to like see the difference between any of it like any of the things would have worked but for me i was like i had a vision that i really was trying to come across and and you know i i do a lot of temp stuff like i'll do temp art or temp whatever and again i like knit I, i'm also creating and again we're working on an animated series we're doing character design i was nitpicking mm. little tiny things i want the outfit to look like this it should be this color green not this color green and i think once you it becomes a product of funds to a degree because there is an extent of you get what you pay for. When you can pay for somebody to do the work that you want to do, it's easier for them to get the result that you're trying to achieve. When they don't have to stress about doing eight other jobs while they're doing yours, they can focus more solely on that. And again, you also want to hire the person that is right for the job. So if you can give clear direction and you can hire the right person for the job, it prevents a lot of that back and forth and you can trust that you hired the right person to do what you're asking for. It's like with actors, a lot of times you see like directors who are super controlling and stuff. It's like, no, you hired that actor. Trust have, them have a faith, little bit. Yeah, yeah, and the person that yeah, you hired. You gotta, you gotta trust the people you've hired. I think a lot of people run into that uh, problem when they can't afford to hire the person that they really want to hire. So that can be anything from like a video editor sometimes or mm-hmm. like, um, you know, I, I remember I was doing my stuff for Twitch and like the person was like super unresponsive and everything. Like I was trying to get like my, my stingers and transitions and they just mm-hmm. were like, and I was like, yeah, getting what I paid for. This is exactly what I signed up for. Right. You, you're literally throwing a dart at the board and hoping that you get somebody who's going to be great at like the price. And that's why I have learned to be very empowered to ask for what I'm worth, make sure that if you do a quality job, you're asking for the quality of the payment that is reflective of that. If you're not doing a quality job, then maybe you don't deserve that high premium, but you know, pay people what they deserve. Yeah. It's 
it, the, ex the exact same problem comes up when you run like conventions. I've run conventions in the Southeast a number of times, or I've helped with them. I've ever been the head of them. But the same exact problem you're talking about comes up every time you have to bring on volunteers. Because when you have, let's say, security detail, if you don't want to put out the money for it, you're not going to get a good security detail. Or if you're trying to get your guest of honor, which is a really yeah. big sticking point, guests of honor need to have a lot of things comped. And if you're not willing to do that and you're not willing to get somebody to help you with that, it will not work out well. It's mm. It has to be a well-oiled machine. And if you don't trust everyone that's in your group, it will not work ever. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you guys know how it works. Yeah, like it's it's yeah, like definitely like I run uh, not to toot my own horn, but but I help run um, the <laughs> largest fighting game tournament here in Ireland uh, called Celtic Throwdown, uh, which is happening this October. There you go. That's a plug for you. Uh, on the right. 2nd of October, uh, so like I've seen like coordinating volunteers and uh, particularly like when people volunteer their f their time It's incredibly generous and it's incredibly nice of them uh, But on the other hand, they also have nothing in this <laughs> like there's nothing against them if they just like decide not to do it and leave midway through You know, yeah, um, and that's a bit of a I think I, again to just clarify like um, if you are choosing to volunteer for something then there's also a responsibility on you to know that you signed up for um, This and like absolutely you should give What is expected or don't even enter into an agreement? Yeah. But at the same token it's up to the people running whatever that is to create a clear um, set of boundaries and uh, expectations. This is what I am expecting you to do. Do you, are you okay with that? You know, before somebody says, I need help with this, and someone goes, oh, I'll help, and then you throw a bunch of stuff on them, and then you get mad that they don't do X, Y, and Z. It's like, well, you weren't clear about what the expectation was yeah. of that agreement. So, you know, there is obviously a, a give and take, but uh, again, you know, when you aren't paying somebody, can you expect them to be running a, like, a marathon around something that you're you're trying to do? No. Exactly, you know? yeah. No, that's, that's not right. And I've yeah. been on the other side of the fence where I volunteered for fighting game tournaments. I did a lot of stuff for my home tournaments which is the largest in the state and i kept running into a problem of the guy running it would not tell me what he wanted me to do and i was like okay i need to sit down with you and figure out what you need me to do am i running stream am i running bracket or am i going to go help players you need to so tell me important. or i will not do a good job it's so so important like that's something i also have to learn yeah. definitely go ahead good leadership is a very very hard and yeah. and and scarce thing to to do and to achieve and it's 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 that's why if you have a good leader who knows how to trust people and hires the right people and um can make decisions and also be a uh, um a good listener and not yeah. a tyrant that is going to lead to that's where most of the successes come from that we see in the world like that's a thing like and and that's where I'm exactly going to agree with you cuz like you can't lead everyone the exact same way that's the number one yep. thing I've learned. I can't tell Mai to do something the same way I tell Neku to do something the same way I tell Taylor to do something. I can't. These people work mm. in different ways. I know with certain people, I can give them sort of... <laughs> some people, I'll just say, hey, I want this done, go do it whatever way you want. Uh, yeah. Whereas with other people, I have to be very sort of specific of like, okay, I need you to do X, Y, and Z in this way. And, and th these people are happiest in being told in this way. And I think it's that's part of the challenge is, is listening to people and learning sort of how they work best. Yeah, and a good leader knows how to adapt for each person or they're able to create a uh, a standard for people and say this is the way that we are operating. If this doesn't work for you, then, you know, maybe this isn't the right job for you, so to speak, yeah. you know, creating uh, expectations once again. But also, if you know you can get to a product in a certain way, um, it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing to talk about, like, from an actor's perspective, because sometimes it's like – are you supposed to baby every single actor to get you know the performance <laughs> right. that you need and you know again there's a line but you know more applicable to like a a typical work scenario um if you can figure out the best way to get the product if somebody needs to like work from home or if somebody needs to be face to face or if somebody needs to like you know make sure that they're getting um a proper break time whatever those things need or they need they need really a, a good laundry list of of explanation of what you to do to very detailed i need this 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 then this then this then this and this and this this if that's going to get you the product you need then then you need to decide do i want to accommodate that or do i want to create a, a conversation to start and say i know that you're there's a lot of things that you need 
Um, and it's maybe hard on me to do that. So can we come to a, a middle ground? You know, it's just yeah. communication. Everything at the end of the day is communication. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, it's it's so interesting that you have to be in these almost different personas for, for uh, different people. And when you're talking to different people. Uh, isn't it weird that no two people are alike? Isn't that a crazy thing? It's almost like isn't that a crazy thought? Isn't that a crazy people? concept? You it's, can't yeah. treat two people the exact same when you're in leadership. I wish, I wish people understood this. <laughs> <I wish. laughs> uh, but while they try to understand it, Neku, do you want to ask the next question, please? So we've mentioned how everyone acts differently and everyone does things differently. You as an actor have a number of roles under your belt, and they all are different because that's how characters work. How do you get yourself into the character's headspace? That'd be the simplest way to ask it. How do you get yourself into an acting space with a very specific type of character? Let's say Rindo versus your uh, SVU role. How do you get into those headspaces? It starts with a good script, obviously. If it's a good script, then it's written well, and you can start making informed choices and, and um, take risks that are based on the writing and you can lean into certain things so um you know if there's a good in addition to the in addition to what's on the script if you get information more so in voiceover where it's like a backstory a uh, write up of of who they are the things they value adjectives to describe them and then i kind of just lean into that uh like let's take rindo for example because this is obviously most people here for the world that's with you so uh with with rindo I got a lot of description about who, he, you know, like one-liners. I mean, I can actually, I'm not going to pull it up. I waste the time doing that. I think I probably still have what they sent me. But, uh, uh, you know, there were certain words and adjectives that I looked at and they were like, oh, he or he was like obsessed with social media. Okay, I can make an informed choice about the, the age demographic that he's in and the types of people. I knew he was like. A, a current, you know, someone 13 to 16 years old of today interested in that culture. I just started, I started watching like Twitch, uh, uh, kids that were streaming like Fortnite and Minecraft and all that stuff at that age and varying different styles. Obviously, I was able to go research, you know, um, eventually when I knew what I was doing, um, you know, look back at the world ends with you, which I didn't want to do too much because I didn't want to like make a, a copy performance of anything that existed already. But I also was able to look at Kingdom Hearts. I was able to do my research, do my homework, you know, put all that noise in my head. I would listen to the soundtracks onto, onto the way to work. So I was in the, the headspace of what I was doing. And then I threw it all away and I showed up and I did what was asking for me on the page. And I think as an actor, you got to kind of like do all this homework, these things that you may or may not see like a, a tangible change in, but subconsciously they're informing you. And it, it might come up in a situation where you're like, okay, I, I created this backstory for my character that this is, you know, very specific backstory. These are my parents. These are my friends. I've known them for this long. This is where I met them. This is where I go to eat every day. This is the, the type of shoes that I buy. These are the games that I play. And you're like, how is that stuff going to help you? But then you might have a line where you're talking about, you know, your mom, like I, you know, that, that might come up and it's like, oh, there might be a, a subtle change in the way I say that based off of the relationship that I crafted with my mom. Mm -hmm. You know, all these very nuanced, tiny, specific choices that I, I, I had to make and, and specifically with with Neo, uh, because you don't get much information beforehand. I really tried to create as detailed of a, of a backstory and a template of, of, of what I could uh, based off of the information that I have. Contrast that with SVU, where for me, sometimes I'll look to other people that I know or I'll look to um, YouTube, obviously, for the people that seem similar I'll, I'll reference family members or friends for certain quirks or um impediments it, it really depends um again a good director will also help you lead you down a good path and that happened with me in the world that's with you um i came in with a a, a certain notion of how i thought rindo was and that evolved to become what we wind up doing and to be specific about that i was definitely playing rindo a bit more uh cynical then was ex w w not that was expected because that was the audition i gave he was definitely a little bit more cynical i knew the world ends with you and i was like yeah this is you know we're having another edgy teen here uh yeah but and I, then they were like but, uh turn it back a little bit yeah and then we we constantly kept pulling it back and we find we found that rindo is not neku at all they're very different characters and i was able to lean into um who i was 
and who I am at well, who I was at that age, the choices that I would make um, if I had these certain circumstances come to be. Um, and I think that you see a really grounded, three dimensional, um, contemporary teen in Rindo uh, that is not Neko in the slightest. I think they're very, very different characters. So the there was a significant difference in sort of the brief that you got at the beginning of the project and what Rindo ended up being. And well, so I auditioned with, you know, it's hard to really understand where the character is going based off of a little bit of lines. Then when I booked it, we kind of workshopped it with the producers in Japan, you know, the, the, the Japanese reps and the director here and the translator um, and the script ADR adapter um, who we were working with at the time. And I would do a couple of takes. And I, when you're giving three in a row, I would do them in varying, um, you know, so like example, let's give a, a line here. Um, can we just not, right? Because that's the, the first one that comes to mind. So, right. you know, I would do, can we just not? Can we just not? Can we just not? And, you know, we'd find out, okay, that third one is a little too dark. Let's lean closer to the first one and, you know, not make him so antagonistic towards his friends. He likes his friends. He's just getting on his nerves. He's annoying you. You don't have disdain for him. So it'd be then that translated more into like, can you stop annoying me? Like, like, can we just not, you know, like how you yeah, would talk yeah. to your buddy who's just a little mm -hmm. peeving you. You still love that person versus, you know, uh, out of my face, you know, that type of... Yeah, yeah going back to Neku me. at that point. Yeah, yeah, so we didn't want it to be that. We wanted it to be like, he has a good relationship with his friends. He's just not, you know, uh, extremely emotional or overly expressive in that love for the people he surrounds himself with. And this is and this is what you have to do for every single line of dialogue. In the yeah, game. and it's it's very it takes a lot of I mean, again, training like you, you have to have a foundation and that foundation teaches you to do all that homework so that when you're doing, you know, 30 days of recording on something that's supporting you the entire time. So you don't come across something and go, I don't know what to do right now. You've, you've created, you know, a, a, a case study circumstances for yourself to be like, if I ever run into this circumstance, I can make a choice based off of this. And that's what acting school is great for. That's what, you know, doing student films is great for theater is wonderful for that improv. So that way you can tackle anything that's thrown your way. And you might not always hit the mark, but you can at least make a risk and a good director will get you right back on track. Uh, yeah, it's it's so impressive to hear how you've built a character profile over a period of time, because that, that's that's just what it is. It's a character profile in your head because they don't give you all the answers on a piece of paper. They can't because it's a voice. You have to enunciate and speak a certain way to make a character come to life. And the homework you do building the character profile is impressive in itself. And you seem to go the extra mile to make the character make it even more detailed than I think I've seen other people talk about when they're mm. like amateur voice actors and they're starting to get into the industry. Mm. Well, I think that's because a lot of people get into voiceover because they love anime and video games and they just love like uh, they don't look at it from an actor's perspective. So when you know you go through rigorous theater training, they all of these things, these extraordinary circumstances and these um, uh, uh, emotional truths that you have to access there's no way you can tell the truth if everything you're surrounding that circumstance with is not based on a specific uh, detail or circumstance you know like when uh, the, the a good example that i like to give is like oh you can love people in many different ways the way i love my mom is the way I, I, is different than the way i love my partner different than the way i love my brother different than the way i love my dog different than the way i love my cat different than the way i love my house or my skateboard i love all those things but it's all very different. There's degreeing differences between that type of love. And if you don't create a detailed foundation for yourself, you're just indicating. And a lot of actors do that. And it's specifically in like video games and anime where things can oftentimes be heightened or uh, characters can talk kind of in a style or a genre where everything is kind of like it's almost dependent upon a voice rather than it is like a, a real character. Yeah. It seems almost like an archetype rather than it does seem like a real person. And I think... <laughs> If you and I and I think Jesse's performance in uh, the original World Ends with You is is really similar in a way, um, 
to the the grounded reality of of my character because i think when we were talking the other day he was like i was just burnt out at that point so i was being that was me saying like oh i'm so relieved that this is over when he gets to that monologue at the end of the game in the same way that i was like i wanted this to just be like a kid talking you know i didn't want this to be an an, an anime performance a stereotypical anime performance i wanted it to be somebody that people could see in themselves and they could relate to and um uh, it would be who maybe I was at that age um, if I was put in that in that circumstance. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. a very, 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 that's a very powerful way to look at it. I actually yeah. really like that in Taiwanese. It's true. Uh, ne- Neku, uh, oh, hold on a second. Neku, is, is, is the car behind you shaking? I think I d- what? I, I, Hello? I think it's, I, I think I, it's I a put, ghost. I put it there because I thought it was shaking. It's, it's, it looks a bit off to me. Like it's, it's almost like something's about to come out. Hold on a sec. What is I? I'm scared. You, you know, push it, push it, push it real quick. I yeah, put, okay. Push the cover. Bye. Uh, I'm alive. Ah! Where'd you come from? <laughs> where did you? Oh, did you find it's, the back studio door or something? Like, you, where did you just come from? How did you like possess the cardboard and then come out of it? Why? I'm did, just not good. You're just what? <laughs> we agree on this. Joshua Power is moving on. You said you'd bring the subway and then we'd let you in. <laughs> Why didn't you just did you get the subway Wait, at least? Where is Paul's tuna fish sandwich? Yeah. I, I demanded never I, was a, the, I never said I was a good intern. Uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, while we find a better intern, uh, uh Neku, do you want to take the next question real quick? So this is actually a question from Floral because she wanted to ask this very particularly. Uh, you have had a myriad of roles throughout your career. Can you pick one in particular that was your favorite to play, and why was it that one? Man, that's a hard question. Um, okay, we're not no punches here, Paul. We aren't putting any punches. We have been asking hard questions for the last 45 minutes, and you expected anything less from our artists. No. <laughs> I, I really, I, I try to only work on things that I, I resonate with or I like I, I have a connection to, so I think that everything I've worked on or I've been lucky to work on, and even in what by some people's standards is a limited uh, uh, body of work, I would say I, I try to, I, I think I really found things I enjoyed in every one of those performances. Um, I, 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 there's a couple of, it's hard, it's like picking children, so I'll, I'll highlight a couple of different moments. I think one of the first uh, lead roles in a play that I did was a, a play called The the Shape of Things. Um written by Neil Labute. There's a movie version and the play version even. It was starring Paul Rudd, Rachel Weisz, um, uh, gosh, and two other, uh, the cast, the supporting characters, I can't remember who played them. Molly something and another guy I can't remember. Uh, anyway, I played uh, the main character, Adam, in The Shape of Things, and that was definitely like the first performance I did where I... It was like real that I was acting. I wasn't playing a supporting role. I was having to like again make that three dimensional person and go on a journey and night after night. And ironically, I got to do it with my now fiance at the time. She played the, the like my co role, and we really got to have you know we worked on this thing every day together. Um, and it was definitely I think a foundation of our relationship as well as who we want to be as artists. Um, we took that shit super seriously and it's a really fun play. If you haven't seen the movie, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting watch. Um, Paul Rudd is amazing. Um, yeah. so that was, that was really fun. And I think transformational for me as a, as a performer again, then in college, I did a, a play called Jack or the submission where I, I, it's an Ionesco play, so it's super avant-garde. And uh, at one point, my character turns into a baby, and then he's laying chicken eggs. It's so bizarre and crazy, and I was the main character <laughs> that, in this thing. That's uh, insane. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was insane. So that was another like highlighted moment for me in terms of uh, learning to be a, a bigger actor. But then, like in film and TV stuff, I actually did a um, <clears throat> I did a short film called Knives, and I worked with two really, really great actors, Peter Friedman and Mark Menchaca. Who um, uh, Mark Menchaca was recently in Ozark. Uh, he was in Manifest, and uh, Peter has been in, in many things, and they taught me so much. And again, I'm playing a very similar role to like Rindo, where he is just this kid who comes across this guy who's selling knives out of his truck. And there's been a series of murders that have been going on in the town. And I'm trying to become like 
in my boring suburban life, I decide to become detective and see if maybe it's this guy who just showed up selling knives happens to be the murderer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Chloe Levine actually is my co-star who went on to do Euphoria and a lot of great other stuff too. Um, that was again, I, you know, a, a, another really fun time working with a director, Aaron David DeFazio, who I, 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 I had worked with before and I really trusted and it was just a fun script and he just offered me that role straight up. Um, and then voiceover wise, I would say, obviously it's gotta be Rindo because right. it was just such an impactful moment for me. Um, because I was a part of something that as a kid, I would have died if I knew you were telling me I was going to be able to do that. I would have said, could you make it maybe be like six years earlier? So like, you that know, could I be can, more uh, excited. I, I can, I can is, you know, I can. Is this where we should go <laughs> uh, real quick? Because uh, well, me and Paul had an agreement that he can, he, he's recording stuff later, so he can't strain his voice. Do you want me to get yes. high for uh, you? Can I tag you in real quick for right, my, right, my. Let's, just give me, just give, tag me in, take my hand, take my hand. That was. Uh, what? Uh, Oh my god, you can't believe how excited I was when I played it. I can't know if you were got me when I was seven to do this man I would have been off the wall. Is that good? Is that it's good? accurate extremely okay. accurate to, to uh, how It's exactly what I did when I found I booked it quite frankly. Okay you got <laughs> it. Now it's I that, need the water it's that For it's that it's that moment of you you've hit an a-lister role essentially and you go This is a dream. That I've been having and it's that me where you go back in time, you tell your younger self that you're going to be doing this and your younger self goes, no, no, I'm not. You're lying to me. A hundred percent. I, I don't exaggerate when I tell you I, every Final Fantasy series, every Kingdom Hearts, the world ends with you, you know, Golden Sun, Legend of Dragoon, Zelda, um, the Tale series, Tales of Symphonia, Star Ocean, Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, um, all of these games I played from front to back over and over again as a kid. Sweet Code, and obviously, which is my favorite series of all time. Um, I, and I was just enthralled with that. That's, that is how I learned to read. I'm being serious with you. I oh, hated wow. reading as a kid. Right. I didn't start reading until like co until plays in college. Like that's when I started reading again and picking <laughs> up books. I didn't read Ready Player One until I was like 22. Um, you know, and I, 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 there was books as a kid I liked as a, like the Hatchet series and all that stuff that they make you read. And I was like, oh, this isn't actually that bad. But video games was how I like digested reading stories. And I found out, like, I'm like, these are some of the best stories. These yeah. are some of the best characters. Where are the books like this? Why don't they just take this game, put it in a book, and put the same cover art that's on the game, and put it on the damn book, and I'll read it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. that, for me to be a part of something like this, where it's that impactful for me, and it made me have characters that I could fall in love with and see myself in and aspire to be and to do the right thing and to be the hero and feel like there is magic and uh, something larger than life that's out there that was it kept me alive I'm, I'm not exaggerating it was like extremely important for me someone who sat in his room all day and played video games and was still trying to figure out who he was I was obviously I had friends and I was a chameleon and I could be the life of the party or I could be the recluse and sit in my room all the time I just didn't know who I was and in video games I could just dream and to to know that like square one of the companies that i looked up to every piece of work that they did and you know cloud and zach and titus and zidane and and Locke, all these people that i loved to, to be on that same like shelf as them it's it's i still don't think i can believe it maybe when i maybe when the the, the play arts that i ordered comes in i'll be like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> it's me yeah, well, it's kind of me, but yes, it's me. <laughs> it's going to be the Spongebob moment of, like, it's me on TV. Look at me. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. I think, uh, I think though, uh, as great as all that is, I think I think there is a real question that people, this is, you know, I, I, I feel like this question is a bit risky to ask. You know, uh, I had to get clearance to ask this question. Uh, I feel like this is the one that really, <clears throat> people really want to know. Are, are, you, are you mentally and emotionally prepared, Paul, for this question? Probably not, but let's go for it. <sighs> What is your favorite haircut? Because hear me out. I did. I did. I did some background research, right? Because uh, I, I, uh -huh. I, I just to, to sort of look at sort of to formulate these questions and stuff. You've had a lot of. There's a lot of range in that hair. Like there's a, there's a lot you've done with it over the years, and I think uh, I, as well as the people, need to know uh, what the hair situation is and what your preferred style is. I uh, I mean, 
I've had, I was that kid in high school where my hair was so long, I used to like put my bangs over my eyes and go to sleep in class. And All right. that, I had definitely <laughs> had like, amount of hair, understood. Yeah, I had definitely hair identity too, where like my hair was directly linked to my confidence and to like me feeling like I could hide if I needed to. If I'm getting retrospectively very psychological about it, I didn't think that at the time. I just was like, I want my hair long, I want my hair long, blah, 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 blah. It, right. it also made me feel unique. I felt like I didn't have to be like a cookie cutter person. I could have some individuality and be different and I could stand out in my own way while also not being seen. Stand out, but don't look at me. Yeah. <laughs> I got that. Uh, so yeah. you know, I, I really love having long hair. I think it's 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 also a little bit like f you to like the um, the system in a way. And <laughs> I if I didn't have to cut my hair recently for like a work thing that I did, I don't think I would have. And um, any any way that it's long, I like it. Will I have short hair again? Maybe I've had it before. I've done it. I've I've shaved the sides of my head at one point in time. Um, you know, I, maybe I will. But I. If if I could, I would dye my hair all crazy different colors and stuff. Oh, oh um, yeah. Oh, what yeah, color would you go would for? That. I think right now, I mean, that would do some sort of like blonde thing right now because that would obviously would just Rindo and stuff. That'd be really fun <laughs> to play around with. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, Extra yeah. add-on question. Would you get your hair as long as mine and Mai's? Because our sprites are actually fairly uh, accurate to our hair length right now. My hair has been as long as yours before, for sure. Um... Yeah, I definitely had it as long as that. I don't think I've had it past like, like it hasn't hit my like chest to that point yet. Like it hasn't, but it's definitely gone to like you know past my um, collarbone and stuff. So, well, uh, I mean, I'm really glad I, for you guys that you guys can have long hair. <laughs> I can't do Short that. Man over the corner, point and laugh. <laughs> my, <laughs> I can only like my hair is like wavy. If if this there's a certain length where my hair just stops cooperating. And I need to like pull out the the big guns. So like no. Well, all the power is in the hair. As you'll like, most of like my superpower that I have is, comes from the hair. So it's I, yeah. I credit all my success to it. I mean, I'm, but actually, that's something I want to touch on, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. as an adult, this question, because this I actually got this question when uh, you were uh, interviewing Jess yesterday, which I, by the way, we'll we'll plug this again in the end as well. Uh, but Paul does stream on his channel, and uh, he's he's currently playing through Near the Worlds with you. So if you want a really weird experience of having every single Rindo line actually voice acted, uh, that's the place to go. Uh, or also, cameo. Or cameo. Yeah. Or cameo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is meant yeah. to read lines. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's super cool. Uh, please, I hope somebody puts puts his links in chat um, as well as well. In fact, he's he's gotten a lot of interviews with a lot of the people that worked on the as well, voice actors and such. So uh, mm -hmm. please please do please do check him out, um, fellow streamer, if I may. Uh, <laughs> Thank but you. my my question is uh, regarding appearance and sort of acting, actually, um, like how this might sound silly, but I'm not an actor, so I don't know. Uh, but how important is uh, uh, is your appearance to sort of acting? Like how how much do you let sort of the jobs that you're going to do or appearance you're going to do affect uh, the look that you have or how you cut your hair or anything like that? Because I know you mentioned, for example, you... like keep, you, you, you shave your beard on purpose, right? Yeah, it's funny you, you say that. These are great questions. Um, when, so I try to keep clean shaven because I'm not, I mean, you hear how I sound. It's not like I'm, I sound like I'm in my <laughs> 30s or 40s. I sound like I'm a teenager or early 20s. And so I try to, uh, being smart about my brand, try and look the way that I believe I can portray not to say that there's not a, a time and a place where I hope I can play characters that are my age um you know like, a, like I was joking around yesterday like a Joe Pesci or something um like you know <laughs> right. like something where it's like fun and it's it's on brand for me to do that but I think I have a very young soul and I think my spirit is that of of a timeless ageless person that often leans younger in age so it's definitely something I'm aware of and I had a conversation with my agents actually where they were like we like you with shorter hair you're a little bit more marketable and I told my manager I'm like I love having longer hair I really like being like comfortable in my own skin and he's like I support that so do what you want and then I got an opportunity to get very close it, it, was, it was a risk what I was doing I was up for a job a film very, very big film where it was based in the 70s and uh, my character was um, was in Vietnam 
um, on, a, on, a, on a naval tanker. So I was in the military and I had done my audition with my longer hair. I tied it up in uh, like a, you know, a bun in the back and I wore a hat and they were like, this casting director hates when people wear hats in their audition. And then I was like, so what do I do? I just keep my hair tied up. And like, I feel like that's going to just hurt my chances. And I was, I felt they, they specifically requested me for this. They were already interested in me. I was like, screw it. I'm just going to cut my hair shorter. I'm going to, I'm going to go for the job because I wanted to, you know, put my best foot forward and whether I get it or don't, that's not, I, I don't really care about that. It's, I just always want to do, I want to present myself as best as I can for the jobs that I'm trying to do. And creatives are notoriously, they don't have great imaginations. So you got to kind of like do all the work for them. So like if your character looks a certain way, try and look that way to a degree in the audition, you know, like, <laughs> like if your character is a doctor and they would be wearing scrubs in, right. in the scene that you're in, like don't wear like a freaking suit. Or don't wear <laughs> right, like a, right. a a hoodie, you know. Wear like a plain tee or whatever that is. Or you know, if if your character is a clean cut person, try and look clean cut and shaven and put together. Don't wear like you know a, a garbage bag. Or, you know, it's like you wanna <laughs> you 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 wanna show that you can portray what this is because people often get typecast. And if you are some, it's very hard to break out of the, a box that the industry is going to put you in. So I try to take all of those questions away and show you, yes, I can do what you maybe think I can't. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's, that's really awesome. Like that's, again, that's going yeah. back to the whole sort of, do you do what you want or do you cater to the masses thing? Right? Like you, you, you took well, a it's hard all within reason. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah it's oh, all within, within reason. Of course, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like if somebody said to me, like, and I've been in these scenarios where people were like, do you want to like cut your hair or like wear this for this? And I'm like, mm, for this, no. But if it's something I'm going to get something out of, then, then yeah, I will, you know, I'll compromise. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I think that's I, th I think that's incredible. Uh, I think the people would kill me if I didn't uh, also begin asking some uh, maybe more some Twitty centric questions. So let's let's talk a little bit about <laughs> that sort of uh, experience and experience with sort of uh, playing uh, Rindo. Uh, I think the first thing that would be nice to sort of clarify is I know you mentioned that you play the game and you and you love the game a lot, but uh, so sort mm -hmm. to elaborate on your sort of connection with um, particularly the game, the, the original game, like were you uh, were you super attached to the original game? And did you know sort of that the sequel is in the works or like how what's your general been connection been to Twoey? Before I remember it playing it when it came out. I saw it at first, and I didn't really know what it w was because I think that you know the I, I had a a mixed feeling about the DS when it when it first came out and using the stylus. Like I just I, at first it didn't like catch on for me, right. and uh, I remember when the game first came out, I was like, ah, uh, I don't know, I don't know, and then eventually I wound up like I can't remember the way in which I got it. Maybe I like wound up reading the back of the box or looking it up online or i can't really remember that part but i remember i did uh i i got it apprehensively because there was like nothing to play at the time i was burning through games i was buying games pretty much <laughs> every freaking week and uh, i was a square game I, I i trusted that and uh it took me a minute to kind of get into it but once the story really kicked in and like kind of right past the stuff that happens with Shaki, like in the uh uh and neku makes that decision to to not be a uh <laughs> a criminal uh, yeah yeah I was that like, moment I was, yeah. Like, I was like uh oh this is this is something here this because it seemed a little bit childish at first when the because the way the art style was you know it seemed a little bit more uh catered to a younger audience uh in the way that the art was done but then when you see how kind of real and dark it is i was like oh this is something i can resonate at where i'm at in my life right now being a teenager and so i remember playing it i must have been i guess in what was it 2007 that it came out right so yeah. i was in high school and i that definitely was with those times i was going through exactly the type of feelings that like neku kind of was and then i i, I obviously i skateboarded a lot in my youth and seeing a character like beat you know you you it's easy to like resonate with characters based off of the simple things like that like yeah. oh this dude he talks like this and he skateboards he's he's kind of cool he's chains whatever like i i'm like oh i totally get that and i'm a, and, I, and i like that so 
Uh, I definitely remember playing through that game and being like, holy shit, this is definitely one of the best stories I've I've ever experienced in a, a gaming sense. Yeah. And then obviously I, I, I loved Kingdom Hearts series when Dream Drop Distance came out. It was so cool to see that, that come around. And um, as with most games, I, you know, I don't remember like every single tiny little detail, but I definitely... Um, uh, it, it impacted me a, a whole lot. Um, and when the, the mobile port came around, I bought that because I remember thinking like, oh, this would be cool to revisit. I didn't even know if they updated the graphics or any of that stuff. Um, I didn't play it when the Switch version came out because I was like, oh, if it's just the same thing, what do I need to, to, to play it again? But I wound up getting the Switch version when I found out that I got the got the role. And that's what I'm playing through now. I'm like replaying mm. through all that mm. Switch stuff. And um, yeah, it was just, it, it was so surprising to, to, to get involved with a game that like I had played. Like that was the surreal part yeah. was like, I, you know, the, the closest thing for me would be getting cast in Sweet Coden or... Uh, Kingdom Hearts or Final Fantasy, like right. the world ends with you, is up there on that on that, that pedestal. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, like I definitely resonate with you um, in terms of the like day two with Shiki, like that moment. That's also what kind of like this is like what gripped me really, and I was like, okay, I have to finish this now because this is. Yeah, I like I like mm -hmm. that. Uh, I think my like I think you were sort of in the sort of. Um, yeah. In sort of the realm of sort of like as well like when sort of Dream Drop Distance came out and when the Switch version came out, right? Um. Well, I was I only got into the fandom a couple of years ago, but like when I went to Dream, well, no, I went to Dream Drop first and then I went to Twiri, but then I went back to Dream Drop and I was like, wow, this is actually really cool, because mm -hmm. like my first impression of them was like, who are these kids? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, it's 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 a whole thing. I think that there's. I think uh, that despite what some people say, like Twiwi and Kingdom Hearts is a very symbiotic relationship, mm. um, as opposed to a very um, parasitic relationship, which something you can find out more about if you look our pod podcast interview with Churro. There you go. That's a that's a plug for you. Yeah, we had a uh, we had a whole <laughs> conversation about that. Yeah, he's uh, mm. that was that that was a, a whole thing. Uh, but speaking of things. Uh, Mai, you want to ask? Man, these segues are getting worse. Mai, do you want to ask? His, uh, <laughs> do you want to ask this next question, please? Yeah. Uh, due to the, to the time frame in which this game came out, we imagine you would have had to record your lines and work with Square Enix amidst the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How was your experience working with Square Enix, and how did your way of working with them change to accommodate for the virus restrictions? Oh yeah, totally. It was kind of uh, crazy to have to do one of the biggest things in my life during a global pandemic. You know, uh, an, uh, an opportunity that I thought would have afforded me a ton of networking and like breaking through to the community of the voiceover world. Um, you know, I it was all stripped away, so I felt mm -hmm. a little bit robbed in that regard because I had to do everything by myself and no contact to everything was under the the sag after protocols and guidelines that they put in place you know no two people at the same time i'm sanitated place you, you know i have to go into the recording studio by myself it was all very kind of safe and procedural and that was great to still be able to do it in person and not have to record from home because i don't think it would have been the same experience i think when i i, I love recording from home but there's a certain adrenaline that i get when i'm able to f actually go into the studio and it feels like you're going to work to a degree um and zone, like right? my yeah and it, like my cat's not like slaughtering my other cat you know in the background <laughs> while it's happening or like some person's not mowing a lawn at the same time so yeah. uh you know that, that that was definitely a part of it and then um but it definitely was it was kind of a blessing to be able to do it to do this game during all of this kind of heartache and sorrow and uh tragedy or, or whatever you know anxiety that people were experiencing figuring out what the heck is going on um so and normally the 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 people from square would be there at the studio but obviously they were all patched in which maybe that actually helped me that there wasn't that intimidation of like oh gosh like they're right there like the the proverbial square <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, you weren't looking they're... through the glass and going oh god the producer is here 
Yeah, like when they see me, they're like, "We hired that guy." Like, who who let the Hobbit in? Uh, oh my god! <laughs> you know, so um, it, that was an interesting thing too. And but I, again, I I thought of it as like a, a blessing in a way because um, I I was able to do this great thing during a time where it could have been really dark and and grim. Yeah, it's 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 well. I mean, I definitely feel you there. Like this. Uh, I've kind of mentioned this before, but like in the deepest depths of like just dep- <laughs> how depressing this pandemic got for me, it's been doing this podcast and doing other creative projects and streaming that's got me out of it. So I definitely feel you um, mm. on that one. Uh, so it really was just like you don't talk to anybody, you just get in the room and then people start going out behind the glass and like you had basically no human contact outside of that, right? Yeah, but, I mean, I could see the engineer through the glass in the studio that I was in, but that was pretty much it. So everybody else was just a voice in my ear. And would you then, like, because like, this is something I'm quite uh, curious about, would you have, in a regular scenario, right, would you have had um, the chance to sort of voice these lines against other people, uh, like where you'd have a conversation and actually be doing it there and then, or has it always been just sort of you just record your lines and record your chunks and then they get spliced together later? Typically, it is that way for video games. Right. Um, a lot of times for animation, you do get the opportunity if you're doing prelay or you're you're doing um, a brand new show that's not being dubbed. You can do it with other people. Um, I think for dubbing, because you have to fit things within a time frame, it's a little bit more technical. And working off of somebody may or may not be the easiest thing to get things at the right time code that you need. Mm-hmm. So I. At certain points, I was able to hear if, like, somebody recorded before me. So, like, for instance, if Griffin was the session right before me and they just worked on something, they would play me a little snippet of what he did and I could act off of that, which was awesome. Like, that was like, oh, thank God. Um, You have something to work off of. Yeah, yeah, and it only happened a few times um, in the game. Uh, I won't say which moments those are, but there were only a couple of moments that that happened for me, and I don't know if it happened for anybody else. Uh, But I I don't know. Maybe because of this type of game, they would have allowed it it to have a certain moment, maybe for me and and, and Griffin, because we had so much together that we could have maybe done that. Yeah. It reminds me of watching like live readings of Japanese dubs like you see One Piece is a great example because like every year they do like a big One Piece celebration where they get all the voice actors in one place and they do a scene live. So hearing that it's not like that for video games is actually very interesting to me. Well, most people or most of the Japanese productions that they do, they're done like live plays like that. They have the script in their hand, games, anime. Most of them, they get to do it um with like the rest of the cast so Dang. for us it's also too like people don't i, I have a real I, I take i take it personally when people like bash on dubs like they go out of their way to bash on dubs you can like whatever you want to like that's fine no one's telling you to not listen to something in japanese or whatever language you want to do it but people don't really understand the technical differences that it takes to make a a dub you're like think about this me and griffin recorded all of our stuff independently predominantly um except for the the times we maybe got to hear each other and it has to sound like we're having a conversation with each other yeah that's like in in, inherently like if you're having a conversation with someone you shift your tone your energy based off of the way your your person around you you know it's listening and responding acting is really responding at the end of the day and you've taken that element out and now you're just literally making an informed choice based off the voice you're giving them in your head, you know, um, mm-hmm. or, 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 or the Japanese, you're saying, okay, this is how they played it. Let me try and capture that essence as much as I can and do it the way that I would do it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. And when you look at dubs that are really freaking good, like I, uh, I've talked about this before, but like Bryce Pappenbrook does it all the time. Mm-hmm. He gives such a freaking emotional killer performance and people don't really understand like how hard that is to do. It is very difficult with all the restrictions, saying things at a, at a certain time, matching the mil- uh, lip flaps, having to get to an emotional place with no lead in it. It's an incredibly difficult task to do. I think this is very interesting to talk about because like, I, particularly now, because I know sort of localization has been a bit of a hot topic on Twitter regarding Twoey lately. Uh, I don't think people understand how difficult it is to localize something. Like, certainly, 
for me, like I'm, I'm bilingual. So, uh, uh. Mm. Well, you couldn't tell by the fact I mumbled that, but I, I am bilingual. <laughs> so like I speak, I speak mm. both Arabic and English. Um, and like I thought about myself and just like for stuff like this, it it's there's no way it's as easy as just you know getting all the dialogue and plugging it into Google Translate and just reading it off. Um, oh it's, no! It's like no, it's, no no no. <laughs> there's 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 cu- there's cultural. Um, there's cultural uh, clues that you need to pick up on and change. There's context clues you need to pick up and change. There's the way people talk in these different cultures is something that you need to keep in mind as well. Um, mm-hmm. Like it's uh, it's it's incredible. Like as you said, it's it's an incredibly it's an incredibly different uh, skill to 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 do that. Oh, I I'm- I think at the the uh localization and specifically the uh we worked with someone matt furred um who worked on the the world ends with you with us did an amazing job of making this dialogue sound as authentic as possible while going through that lens of of the translation and things that may or may not have made sense and and making it more relatable to an american audience while still retaining the integrity of what it was in the japanese in addition to all the other stuff that the production had to go through to make everything happen it's it's Mm -hmm. really a tremendous feat i think i've said this recently but like just making something just getting something made it is easy it is just as hard to make something that fails as it is to make something that uh, or it's just as hard to make something that fails as it is to succeed, you know. Just because somebody like they're like, "Oh, this I can't believe they did this." Blah 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 blah. Like you have no idea how hard it was to make yeah. that thing. Uh, you know what I mean? To get yeah. all the the right people in, involved and and Skylark, I really praise for their wonderful like uh, casting and 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 bringing the people on to like they had to go. They, from what I understand. To, to to make this happen they they were diligent in finding either new people or people that were just perfect for the role and i think that's how i was lucky enough to get a part in this yeah i mean it's, it's always to, to double check to double check something ma you are bilingual right no i'm not okay actually. i didn't actually know or not because uh, no <laughs> I am currently learning Japanese, and when the localization topic popped up on Twitter, I decided to look into how things were said in Japanese and how people thought about translating them. And one of the things that you kind of have to realize is Japanese is very subdued in some regards, and it's hard to directly translate without losing the character entirely. Because if you do a direct translation of Japanese, it's not going to come out as an individual because of how they have to write things. They can either speak formally, informally, or neither. And it's really, really interesting. Yeah. When the bilingual I, talk... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you can finish, finish, finish. Uh, when the localization topic came up, you direct translate first, and then you translate it into what you think people will understand. Because mm. if you direct translate Rindo, he's a very, very... Not a flat character in Japanese, because there's more nuance than that but doing him one for one does not make any sort of traits come out you won't Mm -hmm. get the subdued nature of him kind of being absorbed in his phone or absorbed in social media it's the reason why we got a an angry neku back in 2007 because it made more sense for a u.s audience for him to be more angry and more loud about it and then in the anime we we saw the quieter japanese version of neku and everyone went this isn't the neku that i know well, yeah, because it had to be localized completely differently. Yeah, I think that, well, we went through this specifically with Rindo. There was moments in the Japanese where um, the the Japanese voice actor sounded like he was doing something that was a little bit more, uh, for lack of a better word, like hysterical or high energy or bombastic. And we have to have conversations where I was doing it matching that intensity. They're like, well, in Japanese, it's really, it's it's actually not that big. We'd have that conversation all the time, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and it went both ways. And I would have to ad- adjust my performance based off what was what the tra- the correct translation for an American audience or someone speaking American or English, sorry, w- would be. And that was a fascinating process to to go through. And it's it's a just another hoop you have to jump through to, to make something authentic. And we're talking about like these decisions specifically for the actors are happening in, a, in a, a, the snap of a finger. Mm. We're not sitting down and having a conversation about this, and it's it's literally like, 
okay, this has happened. Let's go again because we got to move on to the next line. So it, when people don't really get to see the behind the scenes and how the, the, the sausage is made, so to speak, it's like so much of this is happening so fast. Literally most of the stuff that we did was one take, like one take three times, like the lines that wow. you Wow. Oh, wow. You know, okay. majority of those things we didn't get to like go back and because uh, because we didn't need to with good direction and good actors sometimes. But there was moments where I was like, ah, damn, I really wish I could I could have did that again. You know, and mm -hmm. the, but the direct a good director knows if we got it or not. Sometimes as an actor, you're trying to make things more than what they need to be. Um, mm -hmm. And you're you know, especially if you're someone like me, you're very <laughs> you have a, a director's brain. You're you're trying to nitpick every little line. But um, you know, these things move insanely fast. And uh, it's and no one. I I would love to see a documentary like about the the making. Like it would have been so cool if we got to film like a documentary about the process of making this game during COVID. Mm -hmm. That'd have been fascinating. Yeah, I would, would have been. loved to see having having the localizer and the scriptwriter like in the same room and stuff like that, where they're just talking mm -hmm. about how they want the line to be read. That would have been super interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. I think like maybe it'll happen in the future. That's uh, let's let's speak it to an existence. <sighs> let's let's yes. Hope. Like, let let us let the podcast and Paul Castro Jr. walk into Square Enix and record an entire game's process. <laughs> God damn. Oh, that'd be so fun. I think like I, th I think the, the the last thing I kind of want to say about this before we move on is like at the end of the day, if you're criticizing really anything, there's more effort being put into that product you're criticizing than you are putting into the criticizing. If you know what I mean. One hundred percent. At the end of the day, like look at the most dogged on trashed on like for example right the like the, the most recent gaming disaster that comes to my mind right which is um uh cyberpunk right like mm -hmm. that game had millions of man hours put people, into it people, millions yeah. people crunched people uh did, over, did overtime for basically no money people there was so much blood sweat and tears that were put into that project which to be fair was mishandled right that's the that's the main problem yeah. of why it turned out the way it was is that it was all mismanaged but all these people's work have been has been sullied because it, it's now like the public joke. <laughs> like this is this is yeah. uh, like as a reputation of the game is now sullied because of that. All for things that they didn't have any control over. You know, the, these creators and devs wind up getting the brunt of um, it, mostly the creative people who are doing the the grunt work, so to speak. They wind up having to to deal with the repercussions of decisions that may or may not be like a corporate thing. Like yeah. we told our investors that it would be out this day, so let it out, whether that is right or not. Um, so and and I, I specifically, I remember I did this thing. So I got booked to do this uh, Johnny Test like web series that was being made. And I was scared to do it. And this is a problem. Like, I was, like, scared in a way to do it. And I told my agents, I'm like, this show gets hated on so much because of, like, the whip crack thing. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Johnny Tess. And I was like... Yes, I actually I, am. I know exactly what you're talking about. So I was, like, super nervous to do this because I'm like, I don't want to, like, be the recipient on, on the receiving end of of, like, just internet hate for no reason other than people... It's like cool to hate on something. And that's what a lot of I see that happen so often. People just want to hate things. Like yeah. it's so unfortunate and I think people don't realize it because the internet you could basically just have your voice amplified to the loudest extent if you say something that's edgy or um controversial and people forget that there's real humans on the receiving end of of, of comments sometimes and just because you feel anonymous doing it, the, the person receiving it is definitely is taking that to heart. Isn't the internet a terrible place? Except for if you're here. If you're here and you're watching <laughs> this on YouTube, you're pretty fantastic. Uh, everyone else, eh. Speaking of the internet and uh, the vehicle it has been uh, for people to just, for, for us to connect with our audience uh, and certainly for you, uh, I want to touch on that a little bit because ever since you revealed that you're Rindo uh, in Neo Twiwi, uh, you've been very connected and very interacting very regularly with the Toy community, uh, whether that be mm -hmm. through your stream or through Twitter, uh, and even as acting sort of like a um, a mid year Santa of going by like different streams and just sort of saying, <laughs> "Hey, I'm Rindo," and then just watch people freak out. Um, <laughs> so my question is, sort of, uh, how has that been? Because I imagine that's quite different from your sort of um, experience with sort of acting and that kind of stuff, where you don't get to interact with people that consume your work as closely. How has that experience uh, been for you? 
mind blowing. I mean, granted, listen, I'm walking into a scenario sometimes where like, <laughs> and it's happened many times. Like, for all I know, someone could be bashing my performance right before I walk into that that stream. You know, right? Um. So, but for me, I just wanted to like. And it happened many, 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 many times, you know, more so than not, where the community is just so excited to, to, to know that I'm, like, engaging with the community. It's, like, been such a treat to see the reactions of people who are genuinely, like, blown away or excited. And that makes me so happy because if I had Twitch when I was growing up, I would have been doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'd be streaming to no viewers. It wouldn't even matter. I'd be playing the games that I played then. And as a kid, it would have been super impactful to me to say like, and I mean, I've, se I've seen other streamers talk about it. Like, you know, remember that one time that so-and-so came to my stream? Like, it has an impact on people and it lets yeah. people know that we're making this for you. And at the end of the day, this isn't just a job for me like what is the meaning of life and doing all of this if it isn't to, to touch people and to connect with humanity and hopefully make a difference for the better um in in whatever way that i can so i it, it, like no one's paying me to go to these streams and do that i just i just feel genuinely compelled to like reach out and uh positively influence people that's really all i care about in life is like making this place a fucking better place than it was mm -hmm. when i got here and when i leave you know so I, I that's really all i care about it's it's fun it's a pleasure and um i really i get i probably get more of a, a, a out of it than the person who's on the receiving end that's awesome that's, that's that is that's, really that's, cool that's, i mean i mean we like i can tell i can tell you we definitely like we definitely love it. Like I definitely like. I forgot your scenes. So I'm like, oh my god, this is cool. Because it's it's not like because I'm completely I'm I'm completely aware that some people like do um do these kind of projects and do these kind of things um and like they have like for example I met Kyle Herbert uh, eons ago uh, and I had the pleasure of Gohan. interviewing him. Uh, yes, Gohan narrator from DBZ, uh, also Ryu. Uh, like, uh, and he also voiced Edgeworth from uh, in the newer Ace Attorney games. Mm. So he's done a lot of stuff, and he's he's a big deal. Um, and like, for example, like he was great, and it was super cool to talk to him. And he was super invested. Uh, but like, probably the the role that he did at the time that I loved the most was Edgeworth in Ace Attorney. Um, <clears throat> whereas that for him wasn't a super like like he 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 recognized it and he was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But he wasn't like you could tell he wasn't as into it as some of his other roles, or it's just something that he did sort of like. Um, as a job, you know what I mean. Which, which obviously nothing's wrong with that. Obviously, you can't you can't yeah. love and be super vested into every role you're in. Um, but I think what's unique here is that uh, you, in particular, but also some other people like uh, like Miranda uh, Cosgrove, who um, voices uh, sorry Miranda Parkin. Sorry, what am I thinking? Sorry, Miranda Parkin. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, confused. Miranda. Uh, but uh, Miranda as well, who's been super invested in, in the community since she's voiced uh, the project. So it, it's really cool to see that you have not only done the job, but also are super invested in the community. You know, that's quite unique to see. Yeah, and I, uh, Miranda is just, she's phenomenal. And I, I I think we're cut from the same cloth where we're just, we're, we're nerds deep down. So like, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and it's, we would, I, I, I'll just say it again, like we would be doing the exact same thing. And... I kind of, if anything, I really hope I'm, like, setting a bar for other people to say, like, listen, I'm not telling you to do what I'm doing, but, like, do not take your community for granted. Do not think that what you are doing has a bigger, like, for some people, it is just, like, you know, you don't have to be super invested in the game. But, for instance, I'm not saying anybody did this, but, like, uh, say somebody came up to me for something I did and they're like, I love this. I love this so much. It had such a big, and if I was like, oh yeah, I, I, I you know, I, it's, that's, I, it was a long time ago. I don't really n know much about it or, uh, you know, that, that I, it was a blip in my life. Like that's going to have an effect on that person. And who am mm -hmm. I to take that experience away from somebody? I am put in the very fortunate position to have gotten lucky and blessed with the opportunity to work on this pro project that hundreds if not thousands of other people would have died to do there's a there's there, there's a responsibility to doing that there is a and and i understand that and i welcome it like I, I again i don't want people like showing up to my house and begging me to like do certain things and say certain lines like that's just crossing the line but if it's just being excited about somebody else being excited about something then like 
why is the goal in life not to like just be happy <laughs> i just i feel like some <laughs> yeah. people have like a different motive in like life it's like no i want to be really broody and i want to hate people and i want to make life people's lives miserable and i want to con- like some people maybe it is like that but as far as it goes for me it's like let's just all freaking be happy and enjoy this limited amount of time that we have here and and make it easier for people who maybe are having a tougher time so that that's that's my the way i deal with things yeah i mean that's that's it's very it's very inspirational and i think like just being happy in whatever situation obviously not everybody can be happy all the time uh, but mm. uh and the way i look at it certainly is like you can, no matter where you are in life you can always look at somebody above you and be like i want that Mm-hmm. and so like mm-hmm. there's at some point you have to be happy to be ambitious and aim for the stars right but yeah. still be happy with where you are and content with where you are at the same time like it's that you don't have to be one or the other i imagine yeah of course um but uh with that being said neku do you want to bring up the next point please so be you actually partially answered this question a minute ago but you mentioned how you didn't have anyone else in the booth with you this is a kind of an extension of that question how is it recording the lines of a game without having context of what you were recording for like let's say you get past like the midpoint of the game and you're recording lines and you have no idea what's actually happening in the game how was that for you and how did you handle it well, it's also compounded by the fact that we didn't record in order. So, you know, you, oh. you as far as you know, you could be recording the end of the game uh, the first day, which it didn't didn't happen, but we re- did record it fairly early. So, you're trying to make sense of and that again comes down to just being I think an informed actor where you can't play um you can't play the entire arc of a movie or a film or a game or whatever it is you can only play the moment to moment and having specificity is obviously going to help that but if so long as you can stay in the moment as much as possible then you deal with what's on the page and sometimes i would be like so what happened before this like what was what was the, the tldr uh like that led to this moment like i would ask these questions i would just take that moment and bob buckle so the director was asked similar questions if it didn't make sense to him he sure as hell knew it wasn't going to make sense to me so we'd have Mm -hmm. to do a little bit of uh and and matt who was the um adr um sorry the translator and and script adapter who's wonderful on the line with us pretty much every session he would give us that like breakdown you know he knew it like the bible and say okay so this just happened you just met this person from here and i would and i would ask questions like but how do i feel about this is did, did like am i annoyed that this happened to me am i you know i I have to just get the, those context clues um, to, to play that moment as authentically as possible. It must have been so interesting, like going through Neo and be like, oh, so that's where this line is. Mm, just for some yeah, of them. Yeah, <laughs> definitely it's happening now. And, uh, it, and to go back to what we were in just the recording process like they, they'd be explaining to things to me like all right you know so there's these things like reapers uh you're in the ug and then there's the rg i'm like hey i know i, I know all this i know this we're good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so i'm like no no let's get to the, like the, the character stuff but that that was that was really fun to uh, like to have that feeling i'm like yep yep I know that. Yep. Yep. I yep. got this. I, know that. I got this. <laughs> I know who that character is. Yep. Yep. I know. I know. Yep. Uh, I, I do have like uh, I'm not sure if you're related to this or not, but uh, when you mentioned that like oh you've seen like bits of the script and uh, I think it makes sense to you, the first thing that came to my head, are you familiar with? Um, of course, the name would escape me right as I was about to say it, uh, but new Spider-Man, Tom Holland, and like uh, how course. how little they give him of the script now because he just can't stop mm-hmm. leaking it. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> they gave him a chance, you know. Uh, he, he's dug his own his own hole for that. Yeah, but it's like it doesn't I still find like... it. I find it so funny how they use him as a meme now to reveal the newest movie's name. Like it was <laughs> oh, on yeah. his Instagram. That was so good. So what? Hey, they... Yeah, I think the the awareness that they have of it is just pretty hysterical. It's like all the Far From Home, and then there's like something else from home. Like they just had to like keep making it. They had to like jump through hoops to to make sure that he wasn't going to spoil it. Mm-hmm. My favorite my favorite thing <laughs> is seeing him every time he's on an interview. He always has Benedict Cumberbatch with him, and seeing him <laughs> trying to stop him every time he's about to say a spoiler is the best shit. It's honestly like <laughs> it is so funny. You should watch it. If you I mean, that's all. 
spoiler conversation, which is kind of what we're having here. It's like uh, that's definitely been a, a, an obstacle here where I'm trying to celebrate this game and also not, um, you know, stay true to the NDA, not talk about things that I, I shouldn't talk to, but also trying to, like, you know, sit here and, and celebrate aspects of it that I can. You know, I feel like it's... um. As a fan, obviously, I'm like, oh, I would love to, 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 to talk about these things, but I also know it's a tremendous responsibility to make sure that everybody gets to enjoy the game at the pace at which they can, and once there is enough time that has passed, then we can have a conversation about Absolutely. some more specific things, mm -hmm. you know? It's such a conversation we, we, we are even within ourselves of like, guys, when the hell do we start talking, and how do we start talking about spoilers, because it's now, it's such a... Now that I know that maybe with the coming of Neo, people are going to be more interested in the game and more people might come listen here. We've had mm -hmm. to think about like, OK, how do we? Because, again, at the start, I was like, you know, about five people are going to listen to this podcast and they're all going to know exactly what the story of the OG game is. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> but now I'm realizing, oh, there's people who have played Neo for the first time or played to it for the first time and they're coming on to, to, to be engaged in the community. We can't do this to them. We have to change it up a bit. Yeah. Well, I think again, it's it's again another balancing act because it's do your diligence to make sure you're creating an environment where people know, like, all right, this is what we talk about here. This is the the rules that we set. We want to be respectful of people. But if you give people enough heads up and warning and say this is what we're going to talk about, it's you know you you can't police the entire internet. Like that's that true. stuff's going to be out there whether you like it or not because people are going to do whatever they want to do and. No one here is going to stop them. So, you know, uh, you you can only do as much as, as you can do uh, and encourage other people to, to mark their spoilers, to just be courteous. Like, hey, we're about to talk about this. If you don't want to hear this, then turn your thing off. And if that person chooses to to to, to stay tuned in, I mean, it's kind of on them at that point, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. There's mm -hmm. a there's certain amount of personal responsibility there. Yeah. Um, it's, so, it's so funny we're talking about that because I'm the head mod of the subreddit and getting people to understand hey we're under a spoiler embargo right now has been the most difficult part of running the subreddit mm -hmm. like people are actively posting like end game to post game spoilers every single day and every day i have to go guys wait 15 more days please that's all i'm asking <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that buffer I think is also very generous to people. If like, I, I, there's going to be a very small percentage of people who are going to blitz through that game in one sitting. Um, you know, just to have a little bit of decency in, in in a grace period, I think is is should be common practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with that being said, um, we don't just have questions from just us. We have questions from the wonderful community. Uh, including but not limited to our wonderful supporters on Patreon, which you can become one of for uh, for only five dollars at Patreon.com. Am I doing this too much? Am I plugging too hard? Is this? Nah, I think I I'm fine. I don't you're, think you're, you're plugging hard enough. Yeah, <laughs> plug harder. Um, you know what? My, have you had your sandwich? Are you, did you enjoy your subway that you got earlier? It's after good. not sharing it with us. <laughs> yeah, you ate that entire yes. thing. Yes, I needed food. Okay. I've been sick all day. I needed a substance. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, can you can you can you ask some of these? These are some of these are going to be a bit more quick fire questions. But can you go ahead and ask some of the questions that the patrons have so generously provided? All right, Sai Matsu Shipper asks, "What is your favorite threads in the game?" Oh gosh, um, I would say well. <sighs> If I remember, I don't remember like in terms of the look, but I definitely remember like specific names. Like I remember there was like the vampire set that you could throw on beat, and that was like pretty OP for him at the time. Um, and then like obviously uh, Jupiter of the Monkey, um, uh, a Dragon Kotor, uh, the Punk. Um, what's the, what was the uh, Tiger Punk? Tigray Punk. T Tigray Punk. Yeah, I I, I like that stuff too. Um, but like personal threads of characters, I think Rindo has like one of the coolest outfits. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say it's cooler than Neku's. I mean that jacket. I mean look at this thing right now, right? Oh, like, man. I was gonna say I was about to fight you, and I remembered you played Rindo, and I had to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> like I just think it's so freaking cool. Um, so yeah, I mean that's I, I'd say those are my favorites. What about you guys? Um, oh, my favorite. Th oh, oh, man. Oh, <laughs> you know, I was what? waiting for that. <laughs> you know what? I feel like uh, 
a combination of Monaco and Jupiter the Monkey are the two that, that sort of stick out to me uh, the most. Because that's just kind of what I wear. Like the, like the out, People might not know this, by the way. The outfit I'm wearing in my avatar, that's literally an outfit I own. I, I've worn that. That's just my clothes. Not with the show belt buckle, although Square Enix, if you get on that. Um, but yeah. th this is an outfit like I own. Like I, I just like jackets, comfortable stuff. Like Occasionally I'll go sort of like into the more a fish sort of jacket courture if I'm really trying to be fancy. But I never... Huh? Never, never too, too fancy. I don't like, uh, even if I'm wearing suits and stuff, I like to casualize it a little bit. I just don't like being totally. super serious. What about you guys? <laughs> my. I, think for, I think for me, like, the outfit that I, my sprite is wearing, like, I would love to wear that. But <laughs> I don't have those clothes, and I like being comfortable. Uh, so, I, <laughs> so I feel like it'd be, like, a lot of natural puppy, but I've, I also do like D&B. Um, what they've got there. I like a lot of the looks that they've got, but I also I do like JVM, just like the look of it. I would never I don't think I'd wear much of it, but and then I think my new favorite brand has just I've become very partial to Gotso and Arrow because mm -hmm. I love Mr. Mew. <laughs> and I just also think that a lot of the looks in the game are really great. Yeah. Uh for me I a number of the brands in the game fit my personal style, and that's kind of the problem. So I'm going to narrow it down to three. Uh, J of the M, Monocro, and Black Honey Chili Cookie. Mm -hmm, nice. Because I prefer... You, you, you can, afford, can you afford that, Chief? Can you put your money where your mouth is? <laughs> um, I prefer a lot of streetwear. I prefer very baggy around the joints, and then you tighten up my joggers around the ankles and stuff like that. I really enjoy that aesthetic. Uh, I love JVM's color palette, even though I would never wear it. I wear a lot of black and white. And then, ironically, Black Honey Chili Cookie is one of my favorite brands because one, it actually exists, and two, it's a lot of darker, high-quality threads, and it's uh -huh. it fits what I want my my adult outfits to be like i think what's insane but i can't spend four hundred dollars on a jacket <laughs> yeah, never get over why... go ahead <laughs> that's why i haven't bought like i've seen a cat hoodie like and that's what i actually styled my hoodie off of on my sprite and i want to buy it but it's expensive i'd wear that every day though <laughs> and then that i would also alter it into mr Mew because i think that i i want a mr Mew hoodie but they haven't made it Yet, really, they. I yeah. well, there's not even like one in uh, like a, a an off like someone Etsy did or something. Um, there probably dude, is probably. <laughs> but the the biggest problem is Square has made uh, a Gatanero hoodie, but it's only a production one. You can't yeah. actually buy it. Yeah. Mm. It exists in the Square Enix Cafe right now. You can see I'm pictures of it on their just, Twitter. I'm just gonna have to go steal it. <laughs> I don't so don't say that on the on the podcast. Like you, if you're gonna do that, you're incriminating yourself. Send it, send it in the group chat. Perfect. It's fine. Uh, I will say, just talk about threads real quick. I love the fact that I love the Tsunamura Mars designs, and all the designs in the game are great. But I also love the fact that they all the outfits that are designed throughout the series just fit no one season. Yeah, it's yeah. like Shook is wearing like a hoodie, but like also a mini skirt. You know. She like, yeah. Um, neck. Well, neck is all right. What's what's another really egregious example of it? Sho if if you wear what Show is wearing in any weather that isn't the Antarctica, I don't know how you're gonna survive. My man's wearing <laughs> a black hoodie with a with a cap underneath and like a black overall. Co it's it's wild. I love. I mean, everybody who follows me um, knows I have a deep love for Show, and just like I think his yes. character and design and style is just—it's—it's it's everything that I wish I could be. So you know, do I, 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 yeah, just suck up to the to host. Uh, <laughs> out of out of and out of curiosity, how do you feel about Joshua? Out of curiosity. <laughs> Listen, I, I think the more you get to know about Joshua, the the more you can um, uh, almost had empathize, maybe or like uh, I I mean, some of the people's favorite characters are the the ones who decide to be the bad guy, so to speak. You know, uh, and I, they're not in their minds whether you consider them villainous or not. They don't think of themselves that way, and that's what makes them fun 
to play, I think. They believe, and just kind of in the same way Show does, like they believe what they're doing is the right thing. And that's what's so interesting about The World Ends With You. It's just so many characters doing what they believe is the right thing. Yeah. You know, the, the, the way to a better world or society or what have you. 100% yeah, I think, yeah, I think with like The World Ends With You, it's such an interesting game because like there is an antagonist, but when you look at the game after finishing it and finishing the post game, like there are no like true villains really, in my mm, opinion. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Ahmed <laughs> almost had Paul on his <laughs> side and then Paul said reverse Uno card. <laughs> Man, you, you think you know a homie. You think? <laughs> oh, that's funny. No, uh, oh, no. All right, you know what? Let's just move on before I fucking like, like, just just go. Just ask the next question. <laughs> uh, Maya, please ask the next question. Oh, that, that was, that was your cue. On. Come, come on, man! How many if, jalapenos did you have in that sandwich? Like, <laughs> you gotta get on this. If you were a player, what sort of psychs would you use? Asked by Agent Random. Oh well, I. I, I, probably something like pyrokinesis type of stuff, any type of fire, but uh, nothing I, but fire pits. <laughs> <laughs> I really do like the bullet rounds or bullet spray or uh, you know, like the things that make you feel like you're doing pew pew. I really enjoy the pew pew mm -hmm. of uh, of fighting, but um, some of my favorite pins are like. I mean, like the, the the Black Planet set, like Black Uranus. I remember it was really yes. fun. Kaleidos Kaleidoscope. Uh, you know, like those are obviously like more towards later in the game that you're going to use those. But those were always really fun. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a basic boy and say probably be. I mean, like, is it? I don't know if I can say that. Uh, but yeah, definitely something like uh, uh, pyrokinesis or something like that. I would say. Right. To explain my nothing but fire pins joke, we were watching the anime. Uh, we we noticed a trend with Neku's pin set throughout the twelve episodes, where his main pin was always a fire pin, except for uh -huh. one episode where he used lightning. So it became a bit every time we saw a fire pin, we just screamed nothing but fire. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And in the anime, he he definitely was a fire boy. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you ever felt like losing, he'd just use a block pin. I swear to God, he's never used a block pin and had it work out for him, <laughs> ever, in that show. Every time, he's just gotten decked because of it. Oh, I love it. Uh, Alright, next one, Mike, come on, let's go. We gotta, we gotta quick fire right. these. Okay, is there a mobile game that you are currently playing, asked by Zeta Slow? Hmm, that I'm currently playing. I mean, I play Hearthstone like that's um, and I was playing the world ends with you on mobile Um, but I'm not like playing uh, Like anything actively. I don't think um, I want to make sure I'm not lying to you here um, Checking your phone. Yeah, Using a cheat sheet. My phone. Uh, Am I playing anything here? That's like uh no, I don't think so. Not not right now. I mean, the games that I am playing are, uh, well, I, I will be playing Final Fantasy XIV very shortly. Oh, yeah. um, I'm playing, uh, well, Pokemon Unite is kind of like a mobile game. It's basically a, a it's mobile basically game. It's basically a mobile right. MOBA, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's fun, though. I I'm, I can't hate it too much for what it is. I was playing Genshin, oh, Genshin Impact. That's a mobile game, right? That is a yeah. mobile game. It is technically, yeah. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I play it on PC mostly, but I, if I'm in a pinch, <laughs> it's I play still a it mobile on, game. You're right. Phone. That counts. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, those are that's I, I, uh, Final Fantasy 14, The World Ends with You, Call of Duty. Um, I was playing a bit of uh, Magic: The Gathering on the Arena Online. Um, yeah. I think we. I, you know, look at these questions. I think like the next question is what 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 uh what was it like learning that you're voicing the main character of a sequel of a game that you loved growing up, which we kind of addressed already. I think you guys. Yeah, I would just second. say it was it was it was mind blowing. It was absolutely I, I fan I fanboyed so hard uh with my fiance. Like we were like, oh my god, I think it's this. like before we actually knew what it was. We were playing detectives and we're like, I, I think it's like a. I was, I was like, is this is this like a mobile game that they're doing? Like, is it like a a new Kingdom Hearts? Is is it like they're they're making a mobile port of the World Ends with You? I, I was just trying to like, uh, is it like Final Fantasy uh, uh, Brave Exeus? I just oh, okay. and then so, when I finally found out what it was, I lost my mind. So, <laughs> did you go through the pain of the countdowns with the rest of us? 
Uh, the, 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 the first one, when the, the Switch port came out, I def, I wasn't like, I, I had, I wasn't sitting there waiting for it, but I definitely remember finding out the news about that, and I'm like, ah, oh, come on, like, what a bummer, like, I thought we were gonna get, like, whatever it was, but, I mean, the Switch port was, um, for some people, a, a great way to introduce them to the series, it added new content, so, while, you just had to wait another seven years or whatever it was, no, it wasn't yeah. seven years, <laughs> whatever it was, you know, uh, you know, it was worth the wait, I hope. I think like, for, for those of us who have, who have been around for 14 years, we've been through three separate countdowns before we got anything actually new. Yeah. It was <laughs> it was nightmarish and it gave us PTSD of Twee countdowns, I swear. I'm not oh sure. Oh boy. If, I'm not sure if you were uh if you're aware of this ball, but uh the first countdown was the one for Solo Remix, the the mobile port. Mm -hmm. And like we just like I, I remember I definitely I know Neku you had the same pain. I was saying like oh, it's twenty two, it's finally coming after seven years. And then yeah. I sat there and watched it and it was like a mobile port. I was like, ah like a switch mm -hmm. port at least like like I feel like I was happy about the switch port because it's been so long that I just needed confirmation that Square still care, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um but man, Well, I will the, say this um, too. I don't I don't think I think that there was more if Nomura had his way, or if there wasn't, you know, other things being made, I think there would have been a sequel probably sooner. I'm, I'm, I'm not, don't quote me on this. I just, obviously the passion was there, but, you know, other scheduling things, resources, uh, things that were already in, would, uh, you know, it just maybe got lost along the way, or who knows why, but I don't think that the passion wasn't there for it to be made sooner. So, fun fact, we can actually quote you on that because you are exactly correct. Because Square Enix had Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, the whole nine yards, they actually mm. had to pull the original Twiwi development team away from that to work on Kingdom Hearts. And it's ah, the reason why it, it took so long for Neo to come out because they, they had to get that team away from Kingdom Hearts for at least three or four years to actually be able to make the sequel. Huh. I mean, that's interesting. It's so yeah. this is the thing, like, because because the reason why I agree with you is because, like, I've obviously without spoiling anything about Neo, but the way this game is written and the way certain things in the game, like these people really care about this franchise. And there's a lot yeah. of passion put into every aspect of this video game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, I'm telling you right now, a game like this doesn't get m really made that often i don't think yeah. i think that no. we're very we're very lucky to see a game at a time right now where it's so much easier to to, to put something out that's going to have a million microtransactions like that's really uh, more attractive uh, for yeah. a company was, to make and so i i just think that people forget that sometimes <laughs> there yeah. was a there was a Japanese only Twiwi mobile game that was not a uh, live or solo remix that had that exact problem. And that's actually mm -hmm. where Coco got introduced before she came in and final remix. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, let's uh, count our blessings here. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh... All right, Mike, what's the next one? What Twiwi character, OG or Nia, do you relate to the most and why? Asked by Exilera. Which Neo character do I relate to most? Or, or, or original. The original or Neo. All right. Well, I think there are multiple characters that I relate to depending upon at the time of my life. Um, I, like, again, I definitely resonated with, with Neku in certain aspects, with Beat in certain, certain aspects, Show in certain aspects. I don't, I don't know if I can necessarily say I had a desire to, um, make people play games and decide the fate of, of New York City or something similar and, and shoot some kid and throw him into a, a, a game for no reason. I can't say I have any sort of <laughs> relation to that type of stuff, but, um, mm -hmm. I think in Neo, like, if you meet me, like, off the street, you're going to pin me to be like, oh, that dude has the exact same personality as Fred. And when I auditioned, I actually thought that was the character I was going to get. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm, this is the role that I was born to play type of type of scenario. Like, yeah. I'm super high energy, funny, and, and obviously when you hear Griffin do it, he does it with such grace and ease that it makes sense for why they cast him. So... I, I think there's parts of me that r resonate with him. Obviously, Rindo, there's so much of me that's in there or, or an aspect of me. Um, 
I think even too, like with Shiki, I think wanting to be seen as something that you're not and growing to learn to love yourself for who you are and feel confident in your own skin. I relate to that. I think if anything, this series creates such a, a cast of characters. And I said this before, I think I said it for your guys thing. Like you can pick and choose somebody or a, a piece of each character and be like, yeah, I see myself in that. And that's what's so great about a game is everybody's always looking to find their character. You know, they're mm-hmm. always trying to say, like, I like this person. And I think this game, it like makes it kind of hard to make that choice because they're all so specific and unique and relatable. So I really enjoy this ensemble as a whole in both games. I mean, I'm a total edge lord too. So like Nagi is like right <laughs> up my alley as well. <laughs> that's great. I love her. Um but yes, uh, more questions uh, from the people, this time from Twitter. Uh, Neku, go ahead and ask the first question there, please. So this comes from the only Brad on Twitter. Do you think there's a possibility of a third game coming? I think anything is possible. I'm not here to say no or or any or confirm or deny anything. I think if if there is... I think that's up to the community, really. You know, I I think you can obviously a sequel could be made. I think there's room for more stories to be told in whether that's the same cast of characters, the new cast of characters, who who knows? But if enough people show their love and support for the series and they let the creators know and they let Square know and you guys continue to create the calvary that you've had and, and turn that into a, a maybe a, a twoey con or whatever the way you want to express your fandom mm-hmm. that's showing the support and i i think it it leans heavily on the japanese audience and what their reaction is going to be but yeah you know the more that the the american audience and and, and other foreign countries can show their support it there is a big market for things other than japan so it, your 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 fandom and love does not go unnoticed i wouldn't say so we certainly hope not. We certainly <laughs> hope not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could go on there. You did such a good job with that one. Ask that one. Go on. So from the Karma Dash, do you have a favorite line that you have said for any of your characters? Like your favorite delivery, so to speak? Uh, um, How can I not say There's spoilers? an extensive list I here. I know that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I'm not going to go into spoilers, but I think that one of the first scenes that uh, you see the cutscene of with uh, Fret and Rindo, which was in the demo, that oh, scene yes. was one of was a really fun scene to record because that was early on in the recording process. I think it was the first like uh, uh, cutscene type of thing that I did, and like I remember watching that back for the first time and seeing that and be like oh shit that's what we're doing you know oh, yeah. and uh, okay so and, it is the, it is the first cutscene of the game i'm yeah. trying to figure out which one you were talking about yeah yeah and to, to to just be thrusted right into that as an actor it was super fun to just like step up to that challenge and be like all right yeah that's where we're going and um to, to pr- portray that authentically is a, it was a it was a nice challenge to do and i i was I'm, I was happy and proud of the performance that I was able to give under the the circumstances and everything. So I think that that whole bit was fun. And obviously the the catchphrase that they gave Rindo, which I would totally agree with, is like, can we just not? I just think that's so applicable to any scenario. Like, can we just not do that? Can we just not talk about this? Can you just not be extra right now? Like, it's just like, I, I feel like that so often in life. I feel like it's a really universal feeling. Oh yeah, <laughs> I definitely yeah. get that. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh, I'll ask this one. Um, people have been asking. I know we talked a little bit about your experience with Square Enix already, but uh, what is your favorite part of what was your favorite part of working with Square Enix? If you had one, if you could choose. Uh, I would. I just think that the entire. Uh, I knew that I was going to be a part of something special, and that made it really. Um, fun and rewarding and that the script was going to be good and the characters were going to be good and they were the fact that they took a chance on me Mm -hmm. it's they there was no reason why they couldn't have cast 
ton of other very qualified voice actors who have established in this industry and could have, you know, from their own selfish gain, like brought a, 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 their own audience to a game that they may or may not have known about. But they decided to, to go with me. And that just goes to show that they care about performance. And it's not just about the flashy uh, blue check marks or numbers that go near an Instagram uh, or whatever that is. So that meant a lot to me. And I, it really, I think there's a reason why their games are so successful. And it's because they, they are very detail oriented like that. And they care about the story and characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh I agree. No, I, it's definitely like that is huge. Like as well. Like I, I, I really resonate with the fact that they took like to, when somebody believes in you in that way. It just it, it makes you want to put out an even better performance and really prove them right for believing. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And I, I mean, not just me. I mean, Miranda, relatively unknown, and yeah, you know, they they took a chance on a lot of people. For sure. Uh. Another question where you maybe want to make sure that your question answer isn't a spoiler, but uh, what is your favorite song from the Neo soundtrack? Uh, asked by I, the Stormfall. Ah, uh, gosh. Um, uh, the, the name is escaping me right now, uh, but um, it's the... Take a look at me. I know I'm not the perfect. Break me free. Break, Break me free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, that's... I, gosh, it's it just hits so hard. Yeah. You know, it it's just such a good song, and and like that whole like trailer bit that they did is like it's just so dang good. Um, the way that they combined it, all those songs, and uh, made like that, it's it all sounds cohesive. It's just so good. Um, I think this, I really like. This is gonna sound crazy, but I kind of like the Neo soundtrack more than the original, and maybe I'm biased because I'm part of it. Um, I you know I I don't want to sit here and say that it is better, but. For me personally, like it just really resonates with me. I feel uh, uh, like it's current of the time. Um, I don't know. I just really enjoy the, this first, this new soundtrack. I would actually agree with mm -hmm. you in that sentiment. I actually agree with you. I, like, it's not. It's, I don't. I don't love it way more, but I, I do love it more, which is saying something because I hold the original soundtrack in such high regard. I mean, the the original soundtrack is a masterpiece in itself, yeah. but I think that they took like there there is an accomplishment in making like sequel not worse than the original. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. whether it's whether it's better or worse, I give it that extra oomph because it's like they did all the right things. I felt like I like they, they there's like a heart that that song is, has like a hardcore. They, they they've got screamo in the yeah. song. You know, yeah. like. They didn't have to do that, and that's the type of music I grew up listening to. And it's I don't know. I just I was like I was like, damn, this is music that I would listen to that I do listen to. So, um, and I'm and I'm bopping the whole time I'm playing this game, like with every song that's on, you know, while you're traveling Shibuya. So, um, I, I just think it's really really cool. There's something like there's something we said. I think first of all, something that we need to address is there. It was an almost impossible task to meet the expectations <laughs> that people had for this game. Yeah. Uh, because, like, it's, again, there's, there's not only is there 14 years of anticipation, but, like, what I was afraid of, right, is the original The World Ends With You was a fantastic game, but it was incredibly, incredibly intertwined with the Nintendo DS. Yeah. Ev everything, to d every single feature in that game what had something to do with utilizing a feature of the DS, whether that be, you know, Mingle PP, where it was almost like Street Pass for Street Pass was a thing. Um mm. using utilizing a touchpad and buttons, all that stuff, which is like that's why the game was so hard difficult to port, right? And that's why they couldn't just port the game. Yeah. The controls are so awkward. Um and that's the thing, like because because it was so uh, neatly designed, like I loved it obviously, and people who kind of got their heads around it loved it, but it also made the game a little bit more I want to use the word. I don't want to use the word inaccessible, but it made it a bit, definitely, a bit more intimidating to approach uh, mm. compared to some other games. Uh, but now, not only is this game incredibly accessible, but it builds on all of the really good stuff they did in the original game and make it better. A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I mean, listen, you're again another challenge that this game had to come across was a very unique style of combat, and then this game had to reimagine that and also make it like just as cool and unique as what the DS was and like pleasurable and 
I'm having a lot of fun playing the game uh, on hard mode right now. I feel like it's it, you have to be super like almost um, very similar to the way that it was on the DS or like a Dance Dance Revolution. You got to hit those marks. You know, you got to hit. You got to. It's like you got to have it be like a song. You got to hit the beat. You got to drop the beat literally as it's happening, and you got to make all these things synchronize in time. You know, when to run out of pin or not. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure, I agree. Like it, as you said, like having a deck. Uh, your own unique deck in this game is as important, if not more important, than than the original. So totally, yeah, absolutely. And I think I think again with the music, like I don't really want to talk too much about the music because I, if anybody's like me, I love just experiencing music for myself. But uh, like the three tracks that uh, we got, the first three tracks we got for the game uh, through the Japanese website for the game were mm. uh, "New Game," uh, "Your Ocean," and "Breaking Free." Mm -hmm. um like it's interesting because like I, I love them all obviously but your ocean when i listen to it is like okay this is you know this is a twiwi song you know yeah same yeah. same kind of vocal tone same kind of like feel to it but then i listen to um you know uh breaking free and it's it's just it's just completely new and different vibe uh that yep. i didn't hear not only from twiwi music but i usually don't hear in japanese music either yeah, that's that, and that again. It's just it goes to show that they are making something that it was on. Uh, it was of the zeitgeist. I feel like, and I felt like it wasn't done uh, with no, out of taste. It was still, it still retained like it was part of this world or like a part of like what Rindo may or may not listen to or something like that. You know, like the the same way I think Jesse said yesterday when I was talking with him was like I feel like Nick who would listen to the soundtrack of the original World Ends With You I feel like Rindo would, would listen to the the soundtrack of Neo yeah it's true there's a fan theory saying that he actually has been <laughs> because of the, yeah. <laughs> the music player and stuff and the headphones which that would mm -hmm. be cool yeah I think one of my biggest things is Ishimoto who is the composer of the soundtrack you could definitely tell he's rock inspired just hard rock all the way and he still somehow reaches out to so many different genres and actually captures the feeling of those genres incredibly well. Mm -hmm. He has such a range, and I'm... It's just so... How? He's able to do so many <laughs> Lots different Lots of study. <laughs> He's a multi-talented man. Yeah, because like every yeah, song is so good. I don't hate a single... Any song in this series. Square is really good about mm -hmm. um, hiring good composers. That's something they've uh, they've not missed the mark on. I don't think in any of their games. Yeah, mm -hmm. completely agree with that. Um, yes, uh, I think now uh, we'll uh, sort of for the last part. We're going to talk about uh, get some questions from Twitch chat. So if you guys have any questions for uh, the incredible, talented, and humble. Paul Caster Jr. Uh, now is the time to shoot him in chat. Uh, you are too kind. You guys are too kind. I'm, I'm not kind. I'm honest. It's the truth. We're not kind enough. Um, oh, gosh. But uh, let's see here. Uh, Max Axel asks, uh, knowing your, knowing how much you love Twiwi, uh, what is your favorite pin or pin set from OG? Tw Actually, we kind of, I think we kind of addressed this. I think you mentioned the... Um, Black Uranus, black the, black Uranus yeah. yeah, the black planet, kaleidoscope, yeah. What was the pin that was like blue? Uh, um, oh gosh, what was that pin? Um, it was like blue. Do you fire, know what it did? Fire. Um, I just remember the name of it was like so freaking cool, and it was like an OP pin from uh, I can't remember. Uh, It'll come to me at the uh, time. Blue fire is what I heard. Uh, it wasn't definitely wasn't blue fire. That's the way I'm. Uh, my brain is trying to make something make sense. <laughs> you're good. So, it, 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 knowing knowing how this stuff goes down, you're gonna remember it like like you're gonna wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of your sleep and remember it. Like damn, who is this? <laughs> um, <laughs> another question from Brett Tendo, the Tapui master memer himself. Uh, is there any character you would love to voice act? Um, that exists already. Yes, I think exists that's what I think. or doesn't. I th I'd say both. You can answer both sides of that. I mean, I would love to just touch, like, uh, for better or for worse, I'd love to, to touch the Naruto um world. I think that that would be a dream come true. Oh yes, um, that would be impressive. 
Yeah, I would love to just be a part of that if I could in some capacity. Anything, anything. I'll be a freaking a Leaf Village shinobi. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> Favorite character from Naruto, real quick? Um, I, I really enjoy Naruto. I think he's one of, I, I'd be a fool to say that he's not, but I also really love Shikamaru. Uh, I, I think that if I am closest to anybody, it's probably like... Um, um, uh, Gara, I really like too. I, I like Rock Lee. I mean, there's so many good characters. Again, another wonderful cast of, of characters. Shiba or uh, 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 what's his name? Um, was it Kiba? Maybe it was Kiba. Kiba got him saying Kiba, Shiba. Yeah. Uh, Kiba obviously <laughs> is love of animals. I'm like Shiba. Uh, yeah. Greeting, Shiba love Shiba. Greeting, Shiba mean... love the Leaf Village. <laughs> uh, Shino, you mean Blue Man? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh yes no that's 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 if if we start talking about Naruto we'll be here another two hours. She know she know that yeah 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 she, she know, know yes she know yeah 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 um let's see here uh, uh when you discover OG when uh uh Mar Mar Chan asked when you discover OG Twitter, uh but that's kind of um well I think the I think year it came like, out for as, sure as maybe as it was the first out. month definitely wasn't the day it came out it was um you know being a kid being in the game store every day and just constantly buying games um uh <laughs> uh um umbra asks uh is cereal soup is cereal soup i love this question by the way because it, it throws everyone for a loop <laughs> so uh, can, can we? Can, can somebody? Oh, do I have mods in the chat? Can we kick this person? Like, can we? Can we get on that <laughs> for sneaking this into my document? Oh my god! Like, who? Who asked this? Umbra. <laughs> Umbra did. <laughs> I'm gonna say. I mean, what? What do you guys think? And then I'll make an assessment. Uh, I want to. I want to hear what you guys think. This is very diplomatic response, <laughs> Paul. This is a very dip. Let's see. So, I'll, I'll give a straight answer. Uh, it is a soup by definition. That's what I'm saying. I feel like it. Like if you want to get, I mean, a lot of things are a lot of things by definition, but people don't necessarily believe that or adhere to it. So it's yeah. hard to. That's very true. I mean, by yeah. I guess by definition it is. Okay. Like... So now, do you do you agree with the definition? You don't have to, but it is by definition <laughs> a soup. <laughs> I'll say this: if you told me, do I want to have some soup? It's I'm not thinking cereal. Cereal. That's yeah, like, yeah. And that's like if you said do you want to go have some soup. <laughs> That's not the thing. I'm, I'm like, I'm not expecting Fruit Loops. Like, yeah. I'm not. That's that's not where my brain's at. But if you want to get technical about things, I mean, it's this. I've had this conversation with people about meat. Like, technically, like meat. They, like, because I'm, I, I don't, I, I eat plant based uh, and like, like a vegan diet. So people are right. like, why do people call things fake meat? And I'm like, well, technically, like meat. There's meat and coconut. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Meat is, is just like that. It's the the the, the chewy. Uh, the, thing inside of something that's edible or whatever it is i don't know the exact definition but you hmm. know there's always technicalities for everything uh, and so i'm a culinary student um knowing having to make soup every week in class we um we did not add any salt to cereal so <laughs> there you go Ooh, yeah, there yeah. you go she got him <laughs> There's 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 your your bar. If you want to call soup cereal, you better put some sodium in there, and you better eat that and not have a complaint about it. If you could do that, then sure, soup is a cereal. Uh, or, don't cereal put straight sodium in there, by the way. Put in sodium chloride. Sodium will just kill you. Here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Here's the real question. Thank you for the clarification. Here's a real question because I've I've caused many civil wars and many discords with this uh, with this question. So I hope you're prepared. Oh, of course. Is this the hot dog question? No, it's worse. Uh, oh, no. Well, it's, it's it's not worse because I think it's more obvious what the actual answer is. But you know the way people in America say like, "Oh, a spaghetti noodle is mm -hmm. is pasta a subset of noodles or are they two separate things?" Oh boy, uh, I mean, I love what pasta an interesting and question. Gosh, um, I, so are we? We're, we're saying that the noodle is the is the 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 root um, of the tree. Yes. If and you, then, and you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you look at if you look at a po uh, a plate of spaghetti bolognese, would you say like, oh, that's a good bundle of noodles right there, or would you like would you say like noodles <sighs> are one thing and pasta is a completely separate thing? I'm I'm gonna use the same logic I used for the last thing because again, when I think of noodles, I'm not thinking of like spaghetti. Like you know, I'm thinking of um, thank you. Uh, 
because well again like different uh qualities of of the 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 way you can cook it like I, do, do people eat like soggy pasta is that something people request i don't think they do exactly my, my my what's the actual answer to this culinary student? oh i don't care i have my answer i don't care what my has to say <laughs> i have my answer what? um i'm trying to think like like there is like a whole section and like I'm trying to remember, but when we did Noodle Day, um, we well, I, that's a bad way to phrase that. Uh -huh. Um, when we <laughs> when we did um Italy, we did like basically all pasta dishes. When mm. we did Japan, it was a bunch of different like, you know, just like we had sushi, we had Don ramen and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And there it so. is. The consensus has come out. The news has come out. Pasta and noodles are two separate things. I don't want anybody adding me in any Discord channel of any description about this. It's, it's, that's it. It's final. It came from Paul Cash Jr. himself. I don't know what else you want from me. <laughs> These are not horses I'm willing to die on or, or whatever. <laughs> I am. <laughs> See, uh, Ahmed will use you as a shield. This is what's happening yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, you have any complaints no, about this no. opinion? Tweet at well, what's your what's your Twitter hashtag? Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ahmed, no. Ahmed back. Oh, man. <laughs> um Oh man. It's fun stuff. Let's see. Uh oh, this is a pretty deep question <laughs> to, to, to ask for near the end, but uh I'm not sure if uh this was by Blue Vexer. Um mm -hmm. not sure if you oh god. Not sure if this was asked already, uh, but what would your entry fee uh, be in the OG Reapers game? Oh, God, the thing I care about the most. <sighs> uh, ending oh. off nice and light. <laughs> nice and light. Yeah, my entry for... Oh, man. Like, while you're thinking about it, like, I, I, mm. I actually don't... Like, I guess for me it would be like who i am like I, I like who i am like i i like it's it's, it's gonna sound pretty pretentious but I, I i like who i am and and how i came myself i'm not perfect yeah but i certainly think like if i like me being this is oh this is gonna sound super pretentious but me being even slightly funny is something you know the way i'm not funny now i was even less funny as a kid but the difference is i tried <laughs> 20 times harder so the so the, the fact that I can like I have a decent sense of humor now and I can make people like I can make people laugh like that to me is like that's something I almost like a little bit proud of myself for like every now and again I was like yeah. oh, I'm, like, I'm pr pretty all right yeah I think for me it would be like my and I totally resonate with what you're saying too I feel like that's like again being able to like touch people or make people laugh whatever that thing is for for you or for uh, I think for me personally it would be like my my values or my ethics or my heart or my love because I love so many people I wouldn't want to say it's one specific thing like I love my animals I love my partner I love my my parents um whatever it is I think it's just like my the essence of who I am like that like mm -hmm. the, if, if I stripped away if they, they took away my values um or my passions I feel like that would be the thing I care about the most yeah what about you guys I my think, first I think for me <laughs> Um, and I've thought about this before, um, cause like it should be like my family, <laughs> but <laughs> right. <laughs> that's not a way you want to phrase that. That's not, that was not a good way to start that answer. <laughs> but it's actually Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it'd be my imagination. Um, mm. cause I pride myself in my creativity and, you know, I use that in my line of work as well. Um, and it's gotten me through most of life. <laughs> And through hard places, so I think that would be it. I, 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 I kind of want to steal that too. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. For me, I have a much more direct answer. It'd probably be my hearing. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm very into hearing things, music, people talking, understanding things by hearing them, and. It, it's a core part of my personality to listen as much as I can. Uh, listening to my partner, listening to the people that I work with, and understanding them through that. If I don't have that ability, I can't communicate and I can't learn about someone or properly communicate back to them. Because if you can't hear yourself, it's hard to speak. It's a skill you have to learn. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. I, oh, yeah. Makes you really question your choice. Like, I, th I feel like, I feel like, I feel like you're, you're, I feel like it's something that has to be chosen for you in a way, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's, it's so deep down in your subconscious, whatever that is, it's some, somebody else or something else has to kind of fish that out because it's hard to kind of make it egoless or, um, biased towards who you're saying it to, like whatever that, that entry fee would be, I feel like is something deep, deep, deep down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we'll do uh one more. Uh, let's go for. Uh, well, let's see. What, what do you have an answer to this? Uh, what is your Zetaslo asks if you have a favorite fighting game. <laughs> uh, Zetaslo. I thought you. Th I thought you said Zetaslo ass. <laughs> no. What I mean. does your Zeta slow ass think? <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite fighting game, I really enjoyed Soul Calibur as a kid. I really, mm. um, I, I mean, I'd have to probably say Smash Brothers Melee because I played that the most competitively. Um, Was it uh, Well, Melee, I played Sheik probably most competitively. Ooh, okay. And I also played Ness. I played Jigglypuff. I played in, in, in 64 smash it was pikachu and i would wreck people on that so right um 64 smash is such a different game yeah it is but i mean it's, it's the same way melee is a different game too because it was um uh, all that we all wave dashing is pretty much the uh you know i gave the, myself carpal tunnel by playing melee for two or three years i swear my wrists do not work the same <laughs> mm -hmm. oh yeah i i know the pain okay and i think uh I think that's going to be it, unless Paul Castro Jr., unless you have any questions for us. Uh, yeah, why not? I, 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 what, you guys love this series so much. If you had to choose, like, one thing you would change about it, what would it be? Maybe oh, without no. spoilers for the new one. What would you uh, change? This was a mistake. I didn't think I'd have to think today. I, I was just ready to just ask the questions. Hey, I this have was... an immediate answer for that question. Okay. Uh, one, the obvious one is more entries in the series. And two, I want to give it a triple A budget. Mm. You, it's, really it's, it's not an insult to the team to say they have a smaller budget than something like Kingdom Hearts or Final Fantasy because it's not a full franchise in their eyes it's kind of my assumption so giving them a triple a budget and saying you have four years go nuts i yeah. want to see that mm -hmm. uh you don't go for, you go first my i don't i, I don't know um. well I'm, I'm putting you on the spot so yeah you, you come up with actually you know what you know what hold on i think i might have something uh the one thing i would change about OG Twilly is probably see I'm gonna say the ending but not for the reasons you think I think the ending for the first game is phenomenal but it only gets really phenomenal when you find out some background info like I think that's one of the things when you read the, the reports game. right and that is like the one thing about the OG game that uh, I wish was kind of different I wish that the ending made more sense right off the bat hmm like granted, like it's once you get once you do get the secret reports, like you, you it's fairly clear. But um, I think for some people, they're never gonna go through that effort. And yeah, it's a lot of effort. Um, so I kind of I just kind of wish that the ending was a bit more clear as to what exactly what happens. Because I remember even finishing the game, I was like, huh, uh, what what happened? Uh, is he? Uh, so I, th yeah. that's the one thing I would change. I think okay. I think I would make more like also remo also remove joshua <laughs> uh, i was gonna joke and be like remove show but i actually do like what he brings to the table so I don't ever say I, I didn't say that so um i but i would think that i would add more like backstories for some of the minor characters because like for example for shiki we know she died in an accident but we don't know like what kind of accident we all just mm. kind of like assume like a car accident but they never explain. So um, more detail, essentially. More detail, yeah. Mm. And even, like, I think in, like, Neo for the social network, they give you little descriptions of, like, every single character and NPC it's... that you see. And it's great. 
I it's more. so cool to read about some of these characters and to go, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah, that's that's dope. Yeah. I think if anything I would change is I would have um I would have put a um cameo of, of Rindo as a little as a little boy. Um, you know. <laughs> that, imagine if that had cool. happened and we saw him in Neo and went, What? Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, also like if you think about it, like having okay i don't want i can't talk too much about this for obvious reasons but tsugumi being the teaser for neo is kind of an interesting choice in hindsight <laughs> mm. uh, i guess mm. they just didn't have like the the whole roster designed at that point or something maybe interesting i still like her though i like her too cool. yeah do you uh, have any extra questions for us sir I mean, you guys are just wonderful, and I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's been an honor, and um, so you call I, us I, nice. It's, <laughs> it's, I think we should we should be thanking you. But can we get a round of applause? Just end the call, please. But, I mean, everyone, I'm, just clap I mean, for this man. I'm yes. gonna I'm gonna clap. It. I think I think Neku I actually clap. Can't have RTX clap. voice on. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what? We're, we're all clapping in our hearts. The chat is clapping. I am clapping. You are clapping. Uh, podcast junior it uh, this stream has been a dream come true for, for me I, if you if you came to me two years ago and said I'd be running a podcast and having podcast junior on it the voice of Rindo I, I would not have believed you and told you to get out of my house but it has <laughs> oh, happened uh, and and really I have you to thank for being so cool and so like really helpful uh, with everything to, to come on I really appreciate it and this will forever be Put down in the history, in the Tapui history books. Oh, gosh. Is... It, that's, it's so kind of you all to say. And it's it, honestly, it really warms my heart that you guys are... This is a, a meaningful moment to you because I'm just a kid and life is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a genuine... This was a bucket list moment for me, genuinely. My, one of my dreams has always been interview someone who has worked for or works directly with Square Enix. And this is an absolute dream come true, just period. Oh, until the until the jig is up and you find out it actually wasn't me. <laughs> oh. it, was, it was Sasuke the whole time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. God damn. Um, uh, well, it is honestly my pleasure. I'm I I. It's gonna sound maybe arrogant or conceited to say, but I'm I'm glad I would put in a position where I can do the right thing. I guess you know I oh. I. I I, I find comfort in knowing that there's people who wouldn't do certain things and I know because of my values and who I am that I'm going to make an effort to. So. Oh, that's lovely. Um, I, I, think, that. Uh, I think, of course, I'd also, I'd be remiss if I did not roll out the carpet for you, sir. Uh, anything that you want to plug? What are you working on at the moment? What do you have working on in the future? Uh, tell oh, people where uh, you can find more Paul Caster Jr. Couple of things coming up that I can't talk about. Obviously, a couple of games. There's a couple of things coming up. A couple of games. I'll say, <laughs> I got a couple of things coming up. So just stay tuned. I'll leave it at that. Uh, definitely follow me on social medias if you aren't, because that's where I post all the updates about that. Um, and the Discord. I have a Discord. That's where I really connect with uh, my audience, and I'm on Twitch where I'll be doing a podcast proper pretty soon, similar to this in a, in a different fashion, obviously about ooh, ooh. Uh, more of a broader um, topic. It's going to be called points of experience. It'll touch on professionals working in various different mediums and talking about the experiences they've had that'll hopefully help, help educate um, people who are interested in whatever that might be. And uh, yeah, yeah. Just follow all those things. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, we hope to uh, maybe maybe we'll have a chance to to reconnect in the future and and have even oh for sure even even more stuff to talk about. Um, before we do, uh, also I gotta say this animation. Uh, thank you to Neku and um, Taylor for making this because because goddamn our artist Laurel Laurel uh, uh, for doing mm. this because goddamn it's 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 the coolest thing ever. Uh, wish they did. Uh, oh, that's today. Ah. Uh, so um okay so this so, episode is next saturday uh, next episode <laughs> next episode is no tomorrow no i can't do tomorrow but um 
The next episode is unknown for now. I need you guys to bear with us. We might be going on a small break, which is unfortunate because of uh, the high we're going to get off this. And, you know, I feel like you guys need some time to emotionally and mentally recover from this interview. Uh, but... You have plenty of time to go play Neo. Yep. Yeah, go buy Neo. That's that's my plug. Go buy Neo. Um, <laughs> go buy and, Neo. Oh, here, here's, with you. here's a plug. I'm gonna be giving away. I don't know. Uh, it's we should be announcing it pretty soon. A signed copy. I've already signed it. Jesse's already signed it. Um, and I'm just gonna try and get anybody who is part of the the Twoey world to to sign it that I can. Uh, abduct or whatever to get them to do it so uh, it'll be like a signed copy with um a bunch of twiwi signatures on it so uh yeah f stay tuned for info on how to um you know go about uh, uh, uh winning that brilliant there you yeah. go all right and that's gonna be it from us from now uh please stay tuned to our social media to find out where our next episode is it definitely won't be in two weeks we're taking a small break because uh, i have life and the masters happening <laughs> so bear with me a bit um, a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening. But that is going to be it from us for now. Uh, Paul, again, once again, one last time, thank you very much for having for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure.